This episode of Dopey is brought to you by our friends at Oro Recovery, created by Bob Forrest and his friends Evan, Jared, and Bob. Their mission, to create a treatment center that helps addicts and alcoholics by using connection and compassion rather than control. Their staff has decades of experience in treating co-occurring mental health disorders, including severe mental illness. So if you're seriously mentally ill and a drug addict or alcoholic, Go to Oro. They will help you. Their detox is as comfortable as you can imagine. Nothing is a walk in the park, but Oro makes it easier. They have amenities you wouldn't believe. Sound bath meditation, equine therapy, the potentially spiritually transformative sweat lodge, and so much more. Their reviews are off the charts. Everyone that I know that has been there has only said good things, and I wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. So if you're fucked and you're willing to go to sunny Southern California, I cannot suggest going to Oro enough. Check them out at ororecovery.com. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by our very good friends at Sober Buddy. They are available at yoursoberbuddy.com or at Sober Buddy at the App Store or the Google Play Store. Sober Buddy is an app that helps you to become or to stay sober, but it is so much more. It is a community. It is an app with a feed, with check-ins. They have a sober tracker, and now we have like seven Zooms a week. I host one Zoom on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. So if you are around at Wednesdays or 1 p.m., sign up with Sober Buddy and come. They have six other Zooms every week, too. It is a community. It is a movement. Check out Sober Buddy at YourSoberBuddy.com. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by Evolution Accounting and Consulting, probably my favorite accounting and consulting firm in the universe. They are a full-service firm that helps you with your taxes, your bookkeeping, your payroll, and almost any other business need you may have. They pride themselves on helping you pursue your dreams while they take care of the rest. If you are a business owner, a dreamer, a podcaster, somebody with a side business who really doesn't do great with the economically accounting, bean counting, tea totaling aspects of your business, leave it all to Eric and Evolution Accounting. Check them out at evolution-accounting.com. Use the promo code DOPEY when you connect with them and Eric will hook it up. If you need help with your accounting payroll business needs, again, evolution Accounting. Dot com. And now, enough with the fucking ads. It's time for the New Year's show. Hello, and welcome to Dopey, the podcast on drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. My name is Dave. I'm in Manhattan. We're recording the New Year's show, and I'm feeling pretty good, as Larry David would say. I'm feeling pretty, pretty, pretty good. And 
you know, I feel good. I never, I rarely talk recovery on Dopey. Maybe that's not true. Maybe I always talk recovery on Dopey. But either way, I've been very active in my recovery lately. This morning I spoke at a, a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. I, do I say that? Am I allowed to say that? I spoke at another fellowship, a different 12-step fellowship this morning. I think I'm allowed to say that, but it's too late. I said narcotics, but whatever. It was amazing, and it makes me realize that the most important thing is that you do something. I've been drinking water, like Jeremy Jackson said, on the Dopey Fitness Challenge. I'm urinating more than is comfortable, but the water makes me feel good. I'm exercising. I'm doing my meditation. I'm praying. I'm trying to put a lot of good shit in. Um, good shit in, good shit out. You put shit in, you get bad shit out. At the end of the day, though, I'm still eating cookies. Last night, uh, what did we do? My friends came over uh, during the day. My fr- and they all have been on the show, Jim, Greg, and Devin. And we played cards and we laughed. I laughed so hard with them that I cried. And I wish that I had recorded it for the show because it was I was crying at the table. Anyway, uh, then Linda and, and Nora and Susan went to a slime museum and I met up with them and we went to dinner and then we got Magnolia cupcakes on the way home from Penn Station and I got a brownie and then when I got home, Nora doesn't like icing. So I took the icing off of her cupcake I I peanut buttered my brownie and then I iced it. That's how fucked up I am. So if I do all my good shit in the morning, it's great. But I end the day with like not great. I mean, the food is, it's delicious, but this, I I need to start over. I've also started writing in the morning. I'm doing these, this very woo woo bougie thing called morning pages where I'm writing three pages every morning of, uh, whatever you call it. Fucking, extemporaneous writing, I guess. And I'm enjoying it. And and I'm passing this along because whatever, we're, we're a bunch of mostly people in and out of recovery. And I'm trying to pass along some things that make my life better. And I've been hearing from a few dopey people who are not doing great. I heard from this one woman in Florida. I think her name is Laura. And she wrote me on Instagram and she was not doing good. She was feeling almost suicidal and she wrote me, and, and I want to tell everybody, if you're feeling suicidal, you know, you can write me, but I would contact somebody that can actually help you. But Laura said something funny to me, which was that when I'm doing well, it makes her more depressed, which I thought was funny, because I feel the same way. Whenever anybody is doing well, I, I, I often feel envious, which is not a good sign in my recovery. But I heard from a couple of suicidal dopes, and if you're feeling suicidal, first of all, contact a fucking mental health professional. Secondly, go see somebody, go outside, get, you know, take a walk. And and I know this sounds so trite. Call somebody. Dopey Zoom is happening all the time. It's posted in Instagram. It's, It's pinned to the Instagram post. Go to Dopey Zoom, talk to people. I've been doing these Dopey Zooms and it is powerful. I got a fucked up email. I'm really excited about the New Year's show. Sean Weiss is back, of course, from The Mighty Ducks. Annie Ellie is back from across the pond. And uh, and one of my all-time, they're all my all-time favorite dopey guests, but one of my very special favorites, Fentanyl J, is back. And uh, and, and he's on for a bit, too. So I'm, I'm excited for all of them. I don't want to play favorites with Fentanyl J, but I get to record with him in person, which is my favorite. Anyway, here we go. This is a fucked up email I just got. Dave. Dave, I do not even know where to begin. I've been listening to Dopey almost nonstop since I found out about it a few days ago. I really, really hope you read this because the whole purpose of the small world we live in is to pay it forward, to spread the word when we hear of some crazy new podcast that helps millions of people or when we hear of a program or a resource that you just know could help people. If only you could spread the word somehow. It's a telemedicine program called Ophelia, And the program is to assist people struggling with opiates to transition to Suboxone. I do not want to go into some huge long email if no one is going to read it, so hopefully you will read this and we can communicate this for real. As I write this, I am fucked, actively addicted to heroin and crack, and I have done absolutely everything in my attempts to get clean. I don't want to be clean, but I don't want to go on like I am. 34 treatment centers... Three years in a methadone clinic that I tapered down to zero. 
three years on Suboxone. I can get clean. I cannot or will not stay clean. Up to this point, I feel I have tried everything. I am literally just done, and I do not mean that I am suicidal. In no way am I that... You know, no way... I in no way am I in that frame of mind. I am unemployed, not because I want to, but literally I have applied to so many fucking jobs. It's a sin. I have an education. I do not have a criminal record. I have had good jobs in the past. But of course, we both know how drugs tend to interrupt and destroy a lot of our responsibilities. And that is Tammy. And I haven't written back to Tammy yet. And, you know, what I'm going to say, I, I didn't go to 34 treatments. I was on methadone longer than three years. Uh, it doesn't matter. We're all the same. I would go back to treatment. I, I would I would find a way, because heroin is so physically debilitating, I would find a way to get away from that. And then you got to just start over. It's the classic cliche. It's, a, it's the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. It just, you have to go little by little by little. And the easiest way to do it is with distractions. And the the easiest way for distractions is by communicating with people who have been through what you have been through. So the first thing I'm going to throw out there that I think I already mentioned is Dopey Zoom. Dopey Zoom is happening, I think, 26, 26 times a week there's a Dopey Zoom. We do uh, the Sober Buddy Zoom every Wednesday at 1. Please come. Uh, go to fucking 12-step meetings. Go to NA. Go to AA. Go to Dharma. Go anywhere. But you have to start with with getting physically off of of the heroin. It's so fucking difficult and and impossible. And it's not going to be easy, as you know, but it is possible and it does take time. I, I wish we had some sort of Unitarian recovery world. I hate the division between the fellowships, between the programs. And, and I'd like for Dopey to be that. I would like for Dopey to be the great tent in which everybody gathers underneath. And when we had that idea, it, or it got perverted as soon as we started talking about it. I'm not even going to say what we used to call it because it got so perverted through personalities rather than principles. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but I believe that all of us, addicts, alcoholics, Dharma folk, smart recovery folk, alcoholic anonymous folk, narcotics anonymous folk, crystal meth anonymous folk, Al-Anon, Narcanon, families anonymous, everybody... We're all the same, and there should be a tent that we all can gather beneath. And it's Dopey for now. Dopey Foundation is going to hit hard in January. But, Tammy, I appreciate the email. I'm going to write you back. Go to Dopey Zoom. The address is always 804-300-586. The password is always toodles with lowercase, and anyone is welcome in Dopey Zoom. So please go. And the dopes in the Zoom are having actually a marathon this weekend, New Year's Eve Dopey Zoom Marathon. So go. And here's Duncan from the Dopey Zoom inviting you to go. Well, Guan, Toby, Dopey, Citrine, and Bread are not in the Dopey Nation. It's your boy, Slam Dunk, calling in. You know, New Year's Eve be upon us, which is a time when some of us may be tempted to take in some of that smooth Caribbean rum. You're done to the Dopey Zoom Room, 804-300-586. Password is toodles, all lowercase. We got a marathon happening this weekend. Don't be shy, stop on by, you won't regret it. And with that, I've been y'all. Toodles! I want to apologize to anybody who's offended by Duncan's horrible Jamaican faux Jamaican accent. But he means well. He means well. And, and every every dope in the Dopey Nation Zoom means well. So check them out. He gave the address. It's on Instagram. And one of the dopes who's definitely going to be there this weekend in the marathon is right with us now. Here we go. All right. So we are doing the, the New Year's episode. And I just love having this woman on the show. Her name is Annie Ellie. She's from the UK. She was on the show this year and she talked about her relapse, and I wanted to talk about New Year's with the great Annie Ellie. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dopey Nation. All right, Annie. So what do you think? How was your Christmas, first of all? Do you know what? It was really, really nice, and it was really peaceful, and it was really relaxing. 
Yeah, it was like, I was really stressed before because I just felt like I had all this stuff to do. But actually when the day came, like my mum came over on Christmas day and she helped me with the cooking. And it was just me, my mum and my daughter. So like, there's no big drunken family brawls or anything like I gather goes on in other families. <laughs> and then Boxing Day, just a few friends in recovery came over and they helped again. So yeah, it was sweet. What is, bo- what is Boxing Day exactly? So we, we were discussing this in Dopey Zoo the other day. So it is historically a day when servants got the day off and you would give servants gifts. <laughs> so it was like a special day, like Mothering Sunday. The mothers and daughters would get the day off from the factories. Boxing Day, the servants would get the day off. It's just been so funny being in Dopey Zoom over Christmas, you know, like having to duck out to uh, so my mum can watch the King's speech as it is now and, and Boxing Day for the servants. It, you know, kind of having so many friends in the US, it makes me realise just how fucking bizarre this country is. <laughs> Wait, 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 hold up. What's the, who is the who is the king of England now? I don't even I don't even know. So the queen died in the summer. Did you not hear? I heard. I heard. Yeah. A lot of fentanyl, so, fentanyl driven memes, but keep going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the queen died in the summer and there was a big parade in London at her funeral. And we watched how soldiers had to faint in Dopey Zoom, which was hilarious. Because they're, they, they're like literally guidelines written on. If you are going to pass out in all this red clothes and this big bearskin hat, make sure you fall flat on your face. Like they can't stop themselves with their hands. Oh, my goodness. Um, so you should YouTube it. It's hilarious. So and, who's the, who's the uh, king? Is it Harry? Or is it the other guy? No, it's Prince Charles. It is Diana's... So um, he's the king. You know, he's King Charles. King Charles. He is King Charles. And so now the, now the, the football, because we've just had the World Cup for the soccer, and so they're all singing God Save the King on the terraces, and it's the King's speech, so, which is so strange for it to have changed because it's always been the Queen. Right. Now, more importantly, how many days do you have? Oh, my goodness. I think four. Okay. And how are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling fucked, Dave. I'm, I'm feeling like the void. Break it down. Um, Break it down. First of all, the last time you were on the show was over the summer, right? No. I know. I've been thinking about this all morning because I knew you were going to call. And then I was thinking I couldn't quite remember. But then I knew it was before Dopicon, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was the beginning of the summer. I think it was like June, May, June, end of spring, I think. Yeah. And and you yeah, were but, you were in deep relapse. I think I'd come out of deep relapse. Yes, you had come out of deep I mean, relapse. Not, yes. I'd come out of deep actual physical drug taking relapse. But I think like looking back, I've kind of spent the whole year in some kind of relapse state. <laughs> And go, go over that. Go over that. What does that look like exactly? Like you are a notorious alcoholic, heroin addict, crack addict, and you got sober and clean and abstinent. And then you relapsed on, I think it started with pills and it ended with fence and, with uh, heroin and crack. And then, yeah. and then how long did you maintain some uh, recovery after that or abstinence or didn't you? You were pretty sober at DopeyCon, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. But it was only a few days. I was like 11 days or something. And that was only because I knew I had to keep it together to like get on a plane and stuff. And part of that was about like not letting Ish down. Because <laughs> he had trusted me with so much. You know, I'd bought the tickets for the flights in a relapse. I'd done some of the planning, like the insurance, getting our travel visas and stuff in another relapse. So like, I was so paranoid that something was going to go wrong, that I'd forgotten something. And travel was complicated because of COVID, you know. Like, literally, it wasn't until we sat back down in Birmingham. No, no, no. When, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to, I'm, I told you I'm scatterbrained today. When I started to see pictures of people arriving in New York, when I saw, like, Steve and Lizanne and James and Mike, 
And I'm thinking, well, James and Mike, Mike's come a really fucking long way. Maybe we'll actually make it. And it wasn't until we were actually, we had a flight to Dublin and then we had a flight to JFK. And it wasn't until we were on that second flight, I felt confident that we were going to arrive at least in America. And before- But then there was still more. Then it was like, then I'm like, are we going to make it to San Francisco? You know, because we were supposed to be on the same flight as Katie. And I, you know, I, I didn't trust myself. I'd done so much of this stuff fucked up that I just didn't, didn't know it was going to happen. Well, I, I, I'm, so, yeah. I'm, I'm years and years sober and I still get very crazy when I have to fly. Like, I'm going to fuck it up and I'm going to miss yeah. a flight and I'm, or I'm going to, or there's somehow some, even though I have new backpacks, obviously, and new clothes somehow there's drugs in my clothes and my backpack or some just whatever weird paranoid thinking that i'm it's not going to work out because there are all these intervening factors before dopeycon when was the last time you used um i think i feel like i was about 11 days at dopeycon right but before you went like were you still relapsing like we had talked you know let's say in june and you were like trying to get back on the good foot did it stick over the summer? What was the summer like? So I had an amazing summer. I did all the stuff for the Commonwealth Games. I met some amazing people. I got 90 days. I got over 100 days, I think, on my, um, you know, the app that keeps track of it all. So, yeah, I, you know, I was showing up. I was doing rehearsals and everything for the Commonwealth. And I was with this, like, incredible group of people doing that and then I was off doing some volunteering at the festivals like doing the harm reduction stuff and I got to about it was a hundred and something days and people were starting to ask me to come and speak at meetings and stuff and I'm like oh shit I've done no work on myself I've you know I've literally just kind of fluked it and then I was at this festival and I think I was camping for four nights and doing all the harm reduction stuff and um after the shift, the people, like the seniors, were saying, oh, do you want a drink? Like, this is, this is what... <laughs> I feel like a lot of bullshit is going to come out now. And when they said, do you want a drink? I'm like, oh, yeah, get me. And I thought, oh, I bet they won't have sparkling water. So I said, get me a Coke. Caffeine late in the day has a really horrible effect on me, and it just keeps me awake like all night. So, like by the last day, I was just burnt out. We'd done a ton of walking, it was really hot. I'd hardly had any sleep. And then I knew that the people I was with were taking drugs because I they'd kind of been doing it the, the night before. And I just had this thought, and it was like, if anyone offers me drugs tonight, I'm gonna say yes. And that was it. It was that simple. Who offered you drugs? Someone that I was working with. What did they offer you? I think they had MDMA, ketamine, and 2CB. Where, where are you working that they're offering you this? At a festival, Dave. It, on hindsight, it was probably, I was probably, you know, not in a good place to be, like, going away from my support network and camping at a mad dance music festival. Right. Where, like, so what did you take? Of, so I took some MDMA on the night, and then I took some ketamine later on in the night. And then I was in my tent. And I didn't realize ketamine, ketamine's quite nice to bring you down off MDMA. I never knew that before. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I was, <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know this. I, I don't know if I'd ever mixed that stuff before. I never but, did, um, but that's what ravers all swear by. But anyway, keep going. I never, I never knew, never knew this. So I was in my tent and I was thinking, what would be really nice now would be a few lines of heroin. <laughs> but then I managed to get some sleep and I woke up and I was like, I think I'm all right. I think I can, you know, I think I can just put this down as like a little blip and I can just move on and I'll be all right. And then I started driving home and like my head was literally like, when I get to Birmingham, I'm scoring crack and heroin. Right. And that was it. And I was back in it. And how long did that run for? So it's not been run so much, Dave. It's been like, 
kind of use an extra time, you know, like score two times and then realize how exhausted I am, how miserable it's making me, how much it's interfering with my life, put it down again, not really do any work, not really talk about it. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm scoring again. Right. Because you're very careful. You're careful not to get a habit. Well, I'm like really mindful that a habit, you know, getting into that territory, you know, I've seen it happen to so many people, you know, where. Well, I'm sure it's happened to you. It's happened to, it's happened to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just remembering where I'm just like, how the fuck did that happen again? You know, and I'm there and I've got a habit and I'm like, you know, so as much as the first few lines and stuff of the speedball on the foil is wonderful. You know, I just can't handle it like the next day and the sleeping and the moodiness and the, you know, and it makes me feel suicidal. It's horrific. And, and you're smoking you it. Know, yeah, yeah, I'm not injected in like over four years. And you smoked it over snorting it too. Yeah, so that gear, you know, you always say fentanyl because I think that's pretty much what you guys have got left. But our drug geography is a little bit different. So, like, the heroin that we get on the streets here is from Afghanistan, and I don't think it's snortable. I I just, I mean, I think I've tried to um, snort it, but I just think smoking is, like, better, especially if you mix crack. And you're, and you're (laughs) you're saying that it felt good but what, what about like, and you're saying you were basically suicidal, you'd get high, but then you'd get miserable. Yeah. What about like you had, you had a few years in recovery in 12 step recovery. D- does that haunt you when you're getting high? No. So what's no. the feeling? I, I don't get, I don't get the question. Like, the like, 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 like that, you know, that, that cliche, a belly full of beer and a head full of AA is so, you know, a horrible combination. Like once you've done any 12 step work using, like it doesn't feel as good because you've done all this recovery work. Did you find that to no. be the case? No, no, it does. It's not the case until I'm crawling back into a meeting going, guys, I fucked up. What does the suicidal like, feeling come from then? Because I, you know, that if you are going to go down the same route, you know, from NA, it's like, but something about finding that we can't live with or without the use of drugs. And I'm just like, I'm shit at using drugs and I'm obviously shit at recovery. So what the fuck am I going to do? It's just been in that place where it's like, I'm not maintaining any type of consistent time, but actually using only works for a very short amount of time now before I can't do it and I can't do it to myself. I can't do it to my family. You know, I've got obligations. I've got work. I've got cats. I've got bills. Right. And you don't want that habit because it's done. You're plunged once you get that habit. Last we spoke, I feel like you were very ambivalent, which I I think ambivalent is like the greatest word. I'm so often very ambivalent about stuff. How do you feel now? We're coming up on the new year. Is the new year significant to you? I'm not one that subscribes to the idea of kind of putting all these expectations on one day to make everything better. Sure. I don't mean, I don't mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about new years. I'm talking about 2023 as opposed to 2022. Is it a continuum in your head or is it like, okay, it's a new year and I could do something different. Or is that not a thing in your head? For me, it's it's mostly a continuum. But I also am like, you know what? It's an. I mean, every day we have the opportunity to start a new year, right? Every day we could be mm-hmm. like, and now I'm going to change. I like the organizational idea of like, come next week, I'm going to put a different effort in. And, you know, it's, I don't know, maybe you're right. Like maybe the new year doesn't mean anything. What do you think, yeah. Annie? You just you just psyched me out of my whole big New Year's plan. <laughs> Am I ruining the show? <laughs> you might be ruining the show. Does New Year's have no significance for you? Not in terms of making a big life change, no. Okay, you well, know, where are you don't... at in your recovery then? So, basically, I came back from America, and I was having... I had a ton of trouble walking. I don't know if you knew... 
Um, I heard. I like, heard. I, yeah, <laughs> I couldn't go on TJ's walk and stuff. I had some serious stuff going on with my feet. So I came back and I booked an appointment with the doctor and I just, it just came into my head. It's just like, hit her up for some codeine, see what she says. She, she just prescribed me like a hundred pills off the bat, you know? And then, so I, I've been thinking about this because I, I was thinking, how long was I actually taking this? Because when I called up to refill all my other stuff, I'm like, oh, can you put some codeine on there? And it sounds like she'd put it on repeat. So I've just basically got through like 200 codeines in about, I don't know, six weeks or something. And I'd used again. I can't rem even remember how many times. I don't know if I'm even answering the question, Dave. No, this is better. <laughs> this is better than the question. Okay. okay. So I, I had, I'd had this plan for like the, t so I'd used again, I'd used like street drugs again and I was all down on myself and I was fucking up at my new job and all this kind of stuff. And my daughter had seen me and was kind of asking questions and, you know. Wait, 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 wait. What, did, what, did, what did she see? Uh, she came around unexpectedly and I was fucked up and she basically, she didn't say, she, I knew she was upset with me. She knew. She knew something wasn't right. Right, right. And that, then, but then she texted me. She's got a job, and then she texted me, and she was like, "You know, if any, you know, I, I just really want you to be okay, and if there's anything I can do, and and all this, but it hasn't been spoken of, as right. it were. Very British, stiff up a lip about it. So things are really on top. I was like, right, I need to sort this out. So I'd kind of plan this taper over Christmas because I didn't want to be kind of moody and you know just withdrawing and stuff over Christmas so I'd planned this taper that would have probably ended yesterday but then I ended up just taking everything on the 23rd and thinking this is all in your head it's only a bit of codeine you know just get it over and done with so I like took everything did you get super high on the 23rd? No. I just, when I say I took everything, all I had left was a few codeine pills and some THC, like, oil. And so, 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 what, like, so what did you do after that? So I woke up on Christmas Eve. I slept great <laughs> on that night and then woke up on Christmas Eve and I was kind of relieved because it was almost just the mental torment of, when am I going to take these pills? When am I going to stop taking these pills? Am I going to feel anything? Is it going to be awful? Am I going to end up scoring? You know, like just, just, it was mental torment really. And so I woke up on the 24th and I felt better. Like my head felt less noisy because I made a decision and got rid of everything in the house. And then I've just felt physically just a bit, uncomfortable but like literally nothing you know it's such a low super low grade withdrawal like barely anything yeah like a bit of crawly skin a bit of sweating a bit of kind of not sleeping great but nothing like coming off the same methadone or subutex or heroin or benzos you know nothing like that it was it was it was mostly what I kind of amped it up to be in my head Sure. And when I was going to do it and that I didn't want to let people down over Christmas because I was just um, in a mood because I was withdrawing. And you didn't though. You, you, you came through like a champ, right? Yeah. Well, and like, I think it's interesting that you, you've been relapsing for like, you know, seven months or something in and out, in and out, in and yeah. out. You never got a habit, which is pretty incredible, right? <laughs> it's pretty incredible. You never went through withdrawal, but, um, I mean, I've been through like minuscule kind of still wide awake at four o'clock in the morning and stuff, you know, just, just like, I've, it's more like something I've had to shrug off than something I've had to grit my teeth and get through, you know, like where, if I think about my methadone detoxes, you know, sometimes I wouldn't sleep for like 10 nights. It was horrific. Yeah. Yeah. Are you kidding? It's the, it's the worst. I mean, it's the worst. <laughs> So, so what's coming? What's the plan? Forget the New Year's. What is the plan? You have four days. What is your plan moving forward? So I've been speaking with my close friends and I'm like, 
I can't go on like this. It's really painful. It's only going to be a matter of time before I do end up with a habit and fucking everything up and losing everything all over. And I, I don't know if I'd ever find the strength to drag myself out of that. So, yeah, I've kind of decided I'm going to recommit to 12-step thing, which I'm not 100% happy about. <laughs> I kind of wish there was something else because I just find so many holes in it. However... I, I hear you. It is the... Uh, recovery in my town where I live where the most recovery seems to happen and the most support is available and there's meetings every day and there's a ton of people around you know I've got a ton of phone numbers and stuff it's the lesser of two evils I suppose what are the problems you have with it I think that's an interesting thing to to talk about for a second so I had, um, I went to my, it was my home group, although they now put in a two weeks. You have to have two weeks before you can be doing service. But I think my service position was off anyway. I just haven't bothered to tell them. <laughs> I'm still in their WhatsApp group. So I went to that group anyway on Christmas Eve and I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to pick up a white key ring. I'm looking around and I'm seeing certain people. I'm like, oh my God, they're going to judge me. Blah, 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 blah. But I just, you know, someone that I really care about was handing out the key, the key rings. And I'm just like, fuck it, I'm going to get one. So I did. And then, you know, the people that I was most afraid of judging and saying shit and stuff were actually the people that came up to me at the end. And they were like hugging me and asking me what's going on and asking me what I'm going to do about it. And it was, yeah. So what's the problem with 12 Step Down? What are the holes you were saying? So, I mean, one of the, the lads who came up, he was like, you know what you need to do? And he's like, you know, you, you read the literature. And I'm like, I hate the fucking literature. <laughs> it's dreadful. Like, I don't want to read the literature. I just want to read, like, drug memoirs, you know? I don't want to read the fucking literature. I don't want to listen to the readings. I don't want to listen to the N.A. Nat you know I'm just rolling my eyes like literally going I hate this I like I, I like how you say literally and literature both <laughs> to, in one sentence I literally hate the literature it's great I literally can't stand the fucking literature thank you thank you for that it's unbearable you know I went to AA this morning I shouldn't even say that and uh good my 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 meeting is in the basement of a church right and you know like where they have the steps they call those shades you know like the big things where the steps are on and i the guess yeah they call it the shades though for some reason and our our basement meeting is the home group for a heroin anonymous meeting okay so the steps say ha on them Right. So the 12 okay. steps has a big H A on it and the 12 traditions has a big H A on it. And um, and it says, you know, we, we found heroin to be unmanageable. So when I'm sharing, I'm like, this is so funny because I'm a heroin addict and Alcoholics Anonymous with H A on the wall saying, ha ha, look at the heroin addict. Right. And I thought it was so funny. And the guy who shared after me, he was like, he's straight out of a fucking, you know, Goodfellas movie. He's like, I find it very disrespectful that it's a HA shade in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I think this is very disrespectful. We need to cover up those heroin anonymous shades or remove them. It was really wild. He got pissed. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of possessiveness in the 12 step kingdom. I think it's in recovery. I think we are so stigmatizing to each other. Yeah. And then we go around like saying, let's challenge this stigma against addiction. And it's like, should we look at ourselves before we like, try and kind of condemn the rest of the world. Yeah. Right, right, Exa right, exactly, exactly. It's like I, I went up to talk to him after the meeting and he said to me, it's not the same thing, heroin and alcohol. And he started saying some shit that didn't really make any sense. And I was like, well, isn't the solution the same thing? And he was kind of like, yeah. And then I just, you know, I, I kind of just left because I really like the guy. But no, I mean, like, I, I think when you say I wish there was something different, I mean, this meeting that I go to, 
it saved my life. I like participating in it. I like doing the work in it. But I wish there was something different too. I wish there was some all inclusive thing, you know, that just said come to get better. But you know, the niche shit obviously works, or or these programs wouldn't be in effect, and we wouldn't go to them. But I wish there yeah. was some bigger, broader, more inclusive thing. And I kind of, for a second, wanted Dopey to be that. But I kind of, oh, yeah. I kind of gave that idea up a long time ago. I just, I mean, you know, obviously, I guess, obvious to me, I've been doing a ton of reflecting and going, am I prepared to give it another go? I think about the book that NA over here does the work out of. And the first question in the step one, because it's a load of writing in this one, what does the disease of addiction mean to me? And I'm like, I fucking don't even believe in the concept of a disease of addiction. Right. Fuck off. You know what I mean? Right. So like, you know, I've asked this girl to sponsor me. I love this woman. She's got a fantastic recovery. I've seen her coming in really fucked up and stuff. And I really, you know, I really care for her and I really admire her and everything. And, you know, I, I phoned her. I asked her if she had sponsored me and she said, <laughs> she said, oh, I hate to be like this, but I, I, I actually need to go and ask my own sponsor because we've agreed that I'm not going to take on too much stuff. So I'll speak to you in a few days. So, I mean, just the very idea. So she, anyway, I spoke to her again and she said, right, you need to stay in touch with me and get 30 days and then we can sit down and discuss this more, which I assume was her way of saying yes. Yeah. So like just the whole idea is, oh my God, I've asked someone to be my sponsor, which means I've got to do some fucking work. Right. And that fucking work, the first thing I've got to answer is that stupid question right. that I hate. <laughs> That I don't want to answer and that I'll answer really kind of um, uh, just like a dickhead, probably. You should just answer it from your heart. It's like you, I yeah. wish there was like uh, it to say you don't have to do it. But it reminds me of uh, the karate kid. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't want to wash yeah. the cars and clean the floor and do all that shit. And then he does it and he's a karate master. And, and I mean, like yeah. we, we do this annoying, repetitive work. And, and most of the time we handle our lives better because, yeah. because we do the work. You know, that's the whole thing. You're like, yeah, yeah I literally am I disgusted know, I'm by like, you. I'm really thinking it and you're saying it and I'm like, shit, what have I done? <laughs> what do you, what, what have I done? But what do you mean by that? I went to a meeting. It's, it's on a Tuesday night. It's actually not on tonight because they didn't have a committee at the time. I went there two weeks ago. And I took on a service position and it's the meeting and greeting position outside the meeting. I'm like, fuck, every Tuesday now and it's winter and it's freezing. I've got to stand outside this meeting hugging people I don't know. Ah, that'll be good. You know? Hugging strangers is always the best medicine, Annie. I'm excited. Um, yes, I do. I'm, I really do. Hugs, I, not drugs. Are you one of those? Yeah, I'm totally. I, I am that one. I totally believe in, in hugs, not drugs. You know, I tell you a little segue so there's a town outside of where i live and it's called rugby and their meeting is called hugby not drugby nice which i think you <laughs> listen i'm excited that you're 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 giving it a shot you don't have to do anything i will challenge that you were probably the happiest you ever were when you got some time you know this is it can I, can I like ramble rather than say yes or no? Well, that's all you ever do anyway. So I'm going to say yes. <laughs> Cheeky fucker. Do you know, I think one thing that made me just get rid of all those drugs just before Christmas was reflecting on the fact that actually for the last few Christmases from 2016, I was fucked up Christmas 2017, but then 18, 19, 20, 21, and then I'm just thinking, I can't do this. That is, you know, you were talking about like New Year's Eve has been a bit of that milestone and whatever. I think it was looking at, at coming up to Christmas and I was going to be, oh my God, am I going to remember this Christmas as one was I really struggling to get off a really fucking mild bit of opiate, right. you know, because I was being stubborn. You know, yeah, <laughs> okay, we've got the. I did that reflection and I was like, wasn't it so much simpler when I wasn't using drugs? You know, I've been waking up in the morning 
it's dark. I don't have to wake up as early as you, I don't think, but like half six, it's dark, it's cold, there's ice all over my car, and I'm just fucking miserable. And I do put an element of that down to, because I've just been chipping, mm. chipping away. I don't, you know, I remember being fully in recovery and being grateful and happy and glad every day to wake up, being grateful that I've got a job to go to, you know, being grateful that I've woken up and I don't have to think about scoring and shit. So when I when I looked back and I saw how I was, I was like, I need that. <laughs> I need that back. That is better than where I'm at now. Well, I, I'm I'm very happy to hear it. I, I always love connecting with you. I'm so happy that we have the Zoom now that you can go to, that I can go to, that we're there together, you know. So I'm psyched for that. And, you know, I'm hopeful. And I want to thank you for being on our New Year's episode of Dopey. Is there any any uh, last words you'd like to say before it's over? I would just like to wish the Dopey Nation a very, very happy New Year. And I hope to see you all at DopeyCon 2023. Nice. So that was the great Annie Ellie. I always love talking to Annie. I always love hearing from Annie. And I think it's always important to hear from anybody who's relapsing. Like, I just think that's an important thing to, to listen to. And, and, and we can learn from it and she can learn from it. And, you know, I'm always, I don't know, I'm a sucker for any kind of drug stories. I, I find them to be entertaining, which is probably why I've been doing this show for so long. And it, and it happens that it also is good for people. So it's a win-win. And our community is better than every other community. So I want to thank everyone in our community for being in our community and making us so much better than everybody else. And I also want to say that that listening to stories and talking to addicts is good for me. And our next guest is a legend, a child star, a uh, dopey legend. His name is Sean Weiss. He played Goldberg, the goalie in the Mighty Ducks and did a million other things. He was recently on the show, fucking brought the house down, and here he is. How are you doing? New Year's is this I'm week. Good. What do you think? Does it mean oh, anything to you? <laughs> Absolutely, yes, definitely. New Year's is a, a time for rebirth, and it's a clean slate, definitely. I'm definitely looking forward to 2023 as my the best year I've ever had on Earth. That's what I'm trying to do. Nice. And do you believe in like, in like the power of positive thinking and quantum energy and all that stuff? That's like saying, do you believe in the sunlight? I mean, this is not a thing. There's like, this is a, this is a science. Of course, I believe in that, those sorts of things. So, I mean, I think some people tend to take it a little too far, you know, like the guys that just, you know, like there is that whole lane where you just sit at home and just think positive things, wishing for them to come true. So I think there's definitely a uh, thought mixed with action, but I think that's definitely a very powerful thing for sure. Right. I've noticed that in the last few weeks, I've been calling you to like bitch and moan about shit that goes down with me. Does that bother you that I do that? Or is it kind of make you, cause you're one of the only people I know that's sober and in recovery. Listen, I love it. I would say, call me okay. more complain more i'm from the the school of kvetch where we believe in that kind of thing <laughs> kvetching brings us closer together is the Mannheim family crest so talk to me what's oh, going on and i do whenever i got you on the horn and i downloaded with you i did feel better you know because sometimes you just gotta say things to one other person like it says in the big book how he says you know takes you know you got to say all your worst things to at least one other human so uh, you've been my human on a couple occasions and I've had a couple like difficult things to deal with within the confines of my sober living place. And a couple of guys have relapsed. And in doing so, there's been a couple instances where I was like handed dope, like like dope was <laughs> in somebody's hand. And they're like, hey, you want some? You know, for me, dude, like the uh, where I'm at in my recovery right now, the odds of me setting it up in my head to like go score and to go get high. That's like, there's no chance that's going to happen. Like I have too many things in place 
to stop me from the time I get that thought to the, like the actualization of it happening. Right. Like so many things will have to go wrong for that to happen. But if I'm in my room and somebody comes up to me and offers me the shit, that's very challenging. You so, know what I mean? So, so explain, explain to me and the dopey nation, the nature of the sober house you're in. Well, I mean, I have nine roommates and I guess, you know, it's, it's a fairly small sober living facility in comparison to these other places that might have like 20 beds or 20 people. And it's just a revolving door of guys that are coming in. Typical stay would be 30 to 60 days. And it's guys that are staying here while they're attending a, uh, an outpatient facility. So this is typically they come, they're here right after coming out of a residential program. So most of the guys that come in are either, you know, less than a week clean or 30 days clean, which is an incredibly, you know, sensitive time for guys like us. And listen, I don't know that this idea is the best idea, this sober living idea. Like, who thought about this? Who said, let's get 10 drug addicts (laughs) and put them in a a house? Right. What can can go wrong? Yeah, what can go wrong? Yeah. Right? I mean, listen, at first, when I was put in this situation, I'm like, listen, all your thinking's wrong. You're insane. Just surrender and do whatever these people say. But now, like two years into it, when the only thing that can possibly derail my recovery is the environment that I'm in. It's daunting, man, to say the least. So, you know, these are all great guys, right? And when they're sober, they're fantastic. But, you know, as soon as we get on one, that's it. We get on one. And so a few days ago, one of my roommates told me that he's going to be going back to residential treatment. And I could read the situation. I could tell what was going on. And I could see that she was clearly getting a a stipend from somebody, from a broker. So he's getting paid cash because the guy who didn't, was like living off of EBTs now got like new Jordans and a new Xbox and stuff. And, you know, he's telling me that in a few days he's going back into residential. Now, here's the problem. He's living in a sober living He's got a planned trip into residential treatment, but to get into residential treatment and have your insurance pick up, you got to test positive. Mm. Right. So now we know I knew this guy is going to be getting high and, you know, he turned out to go completely off the rails during Christmas running around the house, threatening uh, other clients to stab them and, you know, I don't want to get too specific because I don't want to hurt his feelings, but there, there was that the, the kid where you sent me the video of the kid screaming. In no, the no, no, that was a different kid a week, two weeks earlier, but that was another stabbing incident. It was another, yeah, some guy had a knife and he was going to like stab some other guy. And the video I sent you, I mean, I, it was just audio really. Cause I had locked my door. I locked myself in my room, dude. It's just kind of a. I say you the video just really because I tell these stories to people about the shit that goes down, and I feel like it sounds like I'm exaggerating. You know what I mean? Like if I just told you, yeah, David, there's guys like knife play threatening to stab people, you might think, well, perhaps you know he might be exaggerating. So that's kind of why I sent you the uh, the video. <laughs> so this happened to me two times in the last two weeks where I was offered dope, dude, in my house. And here's the thing. The first time it happened, and I'm kind of mad about this. This is why I'm telling you. The first time it happened, it was dope that was found on the property that had been seized by the staff member, by a staff member. So so some guy had dope. They confiscated it. And instead of getting rid of it or throwing it away, they kept it on the premises. And I mean a lot of it. I've never seen a piece of dope this big. How did it get back to you? The the guy has it. It's confiscated. Got, At what point is it offered to you? So it got confiscated, and it was in a locked-off area of the house, like a garage-type area. And they broke into the garage and stole the stuff that was confiscated. <laughs> and, then to, and then to show off to me, 
Um, he just wanted to show me like what they found and also in doing so basically, you know, offering me the, the stuff. So it really didn't affect me. I'll be honest with you. It made me more angry than anything because I paid $2,000 a month just to live in a, what, like to rent a room. And part of the reason it's, it costs that much is because it's supposed to be a, you know, a, a secure environment. So I was just kind of angry about it, but David, the thing I'm most proud about is that I really didn't spend much time fantasizing about getting hot. Maybe for five or six seconds did I think, you know, there's a smoke shop right down the street. My favorite thing in the world is a fresh pookie, dude. Like fresh pookie and a new torch is like better than a blowjob for me. And so I thought about it for a second. I could get away with it one time. Nobody will know. I'll smoke one bowl. It'll be the first time I smoke meth in three years. And yeah, I had that I had that fantasy for a few seconds. So I don't know. It's dangerous. So what do you, you know? do? What do you do with that? It's a few seconds, and then how do you change the channel in your mind? I don't. I think I called you. I think so. It wasn't too long, much longer after that. So like in this sober living environment, it's like kind of like jail in that it's the prisoners versus the guards, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I just try to stay on the guard side. Right. Does that put that you? Does sense. that put you at odds with the other residents? I get, yeah. I mean, it keeps me out of their circles. Like, I'm not in like the hangout circle on the patio, you know. And I think they know to like the smart ones at least know to not air their shit because I will drop a dime to management, and I don't care about that. Like, I like they know I. So well, the million dollar um, yeah, the million dollar question is how long are you going to stay? Well, I've been looking for other, I've been looking for places to go and I just can't find, you know, a place. It's, it's really hard in LA to get an apartment just with like your credit. You have to have like amazing credit to move in and there's a rental crisis. So it's not like they have to like, you know, <laughs> rent an apartment to somebody they don't want to. They can rent an apartment to a guy with a lot of, you know, what I don't have is a uh, uh, proved income. <laughs> right. That part. <laughs> Right. You know, I get residuals and shit, and I can't really show my cameos as, uh, right. as you know, proven income. So it, it, it's difficult, you know? So consequently, I'm just looking around for, like, some heavy girl to, like, take me in and, you know, have me move into her apartment if possible. Well, maybe we should, put out, well, maybe we should put out a thing on the Dopey Nation right now. Dopey Nation, if you're in Los <laughs> Angeles and you're looking to have Sean maybe be a housemaid. No, no, listen, let me tell you something. I am spotlessly neat, like almost OCD level. I will clean your house. I come from a long line of proud toilet cleaners. Okay. Like my dad carried a toilet brush with him to like even formal events. Nice. And he passed that down to me. Like I'm proud of, of the way I clean a toilet. And also bacon and eggs. I do bacon and eggs very well. I make coffee. So having me on the couch is almost like, it would almost be like a good thing for people. You know what I mean? Or maybe somebody with an extra room or some sort of garden apartment. Mm -hmm. maybe. Listen, write me at dopeypodcast at gmail.com. Sean should get out of this house. Sean, how often are the body brokers brokering around the spot you live in? I mean, I never see them because they, uh, I don't know, I'm just not in that loop. But it's all the time, David. Like these guys, I, I never see, I always see the, them go out of the program the same way. And I'm not trying to talk shit, believe me. <laughs> I want what's best for these guys. But I just, it's almost like this sober living is set up to make guys fail. So they have to go through the system because like Chris Rock said, the money's not in the cure. It's in the treatment, right? Like these, there's, it's not a billion dollar, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a treatment industry, not a, not a cure industry. So I, I don't know. Um, that's a sad, I, I think that's a sad, a little, sad kind of idea, right? That, but I guess that's that's kind of what runs most capitalist enterprises. It just sucks when it's something like what we're afflicted with. But I mean, like, we also know as drug addicts in recovery that I can't imagine what a cure could look like. You know, the cure comes from within, right? Like, the, the, the light goes Absolutely. on inside you, and then you're like, okay, I can try to do this. And that's where the cure comes from. The idea that the cure can be external is basically impossible. I had a friend who used to be a body broker out there and I just, I just find it to be such a crazy thing, you know, that rehabs are paying drug addicts to get other drug addicts to go to treatment. 
it just seems like real bottom of the barrel ethics right there. And it isn't that cut and dry. And the worst part about it, David, I mean, I don't know that that it's that the rehab people are paying guy. You know, I don't know if it's that cut and dry. And where it gets uh, muddy is when these broker people come in. That's the, those are the people that are kind of screwing it up for everybody. And the worst detrimental part, David, is when these kids die. There are kids die yeah. that OD going through this process. Spell out who the broker people are for me. The broker people are just kind of independent guys that go and find kids that, that they can put into treatment. Like they'll literally find, you know, a drug addict outside of a 7-Eleven and they'll say, hey, kid, you want to go to Florida? I'll put you on a plane today and here's a few thousand dollars cash and you'll be in treatment by tomorrow and you'll clean your life up. So to the kid, it sounds great. And to the guy, it sounds great. So now the broker who gets his cash from the uh, treatment place, that might be the, the gray area that maybe right. may need to be eliminated. But, you know, I don't know enough about it because right when I got into residential treatment, nobody really approached me. I wasn't one of the guys that got approached because people kind of knew all. I think they knew my story and they knew that maybe they couldn't use me as a puppet in that kind of way because I had sort of a, a public spotlight on my case and they didn't want to get involved with me on that level. So I was, I never really went through the pipeline with this stuff. So I'm only going by what I see from outside. But one of the kids who's like my buddy who just went back into treatment, he'd be able to tell you a lot better about how it works. But I remember the first time I ever heard about this, I was in uh, at residential and one of the kids in 21 days uh, came up and he was he was starting to pack his things. And I thought he was going to be there for 30 days. And he he thought I knew the hustle. And uh, he said, well, no, you know, you get paid after the 21st day is the day the insurance company pays out. So you don't have to stay for the full 30 days. And then he said to me, he asked me how much I was getting paid to be there. And I was like, what? And he said, you're, he said, you're not getting paid to be here. And at that moment, I was like, wait a second, I'm really missing out. Like. <laughs> totally. I can't leave a lot of money on the table. I know. But it, it you makes know. me it makes me feel like I should go back to treatment just because I'm missing out on a fucking David, how if if you were a kid, right, and you were 21 years old and you like to get high, how in the world would you be able to say no to a guy that's gonna give you five grand, a bag of dope, put you in a hotel for a weekend, and then send you to a really posh treatment place where you're gonna basically live at a resort for 30 days or 21 days? And while you're there, you're on medication the whole time, no. you know? So as soon as you get to these treatment places, the first thing they do is dope. Like for me, Seroquel, I had never been on Seroquel. And the first day I got there, the doctor put me on Seroquel for sleep, which is a really powerful. Antipsychotic. Right? Yeah. yeah. So most of these kids, most of us kids, as soon as we get into treatment, we're like, you know, by 9 p.m., we're drooling on ourselves for our Seroquel. So you where well, my point is you get to your you go to your 30 days at residential and you're basically high the whole time there. Well, I could <laughs> I could never have said no to it. Uh and it seems like I know what I'm but no one ever offered me either. It seems like the people that the kids that get offered this are like lottery winning drug addicts. You have to have that kind of special insurance that they like. Right. That's the one thing. Right. Now I don't know what that is. Now, this year, we had a great year in the in the dopey world, and one of our greatest episodes of the year was your episode. Oh, and that's great. Everybody loved it. It was like, it was, it was a commanding, it was also, it was, I mean, the thing that made it so good was, number one, you were in person, and we had a good time, and number two, you were an open book, and you actually considered what I said to you, you know what I mean? It was incredibly... Yeah real and i really enjoyed it and then fucking page six of the new york post picked up a story from the piece and uh <laughs> and, and and wrote about the the judd apatow immense thing how did your dopey experience affect you positively or negatively this year if at all well i had a i had a great time talking with you it was one of the highlights of my trip to new york and i really made special arrangements to come see you <laughs> I hope no you shit. know, like, no it was shit. Yeah. a big part of my plan. But you actually got me to start thinking about some things that I had never really thought about that are actually some pretty big pieces to the puzzle that I that nobody had ever even mentioned to me. It's kind of like some really obvious shit. 
I mean, I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from your insight or anything, yes, but thank like, you. you know, I mean, it was like, but these are things that I can't believe I'd never thought about like a thousand hours of fucking therapy. What were we talking about? <laughs> So, yeah, I I had been, you know, constantly growing from, like, the talk that we had. And then the thing when the page six came out, I to be honest, it, it's sort of embarrassing. You know, it's just very embarrassing for me because it, it's difficult sometimes having excluded myself from that loop. You know, watching those guys all blow up and be millionaires while I'm <laughs> sober living, it's, thing, it's I have to deal with it from time to time. So when an article like that comes out that really highlights how responsible I was for my own fucked up situation, it's, you know, kind of embarrassing. And I don't I didn't want Judd to also feel stupid for having been linked to a story like that, you know? Right. <laughs> I just felt bad on, on all levels. Any update on the Apatow amend? I've been thinking about it long and hard, and I just keep thinking, like, as soon as I send him that amend, he's going to be like, fuck you, somebody told you to do this. I just feel like my amend to him is just by, le- like, staying away forever. Well, I mean, that's... I, mean, <laughs> but I don't know. I can the, be talked out of that. The, like, what, is, what do you call that? That You call that a living amend, right? As opposed yes, to, a, like, a right. direct amend. Which, listen, sure, I, yeah. I cannot say that a living amend isn't the more appropriate amend, but a letter, I, I think a letter would be good. But that's just my take. You know, here, here's the thing. I feel like if I make an amend, it's totally for me. Like, yes. if I thought for one second it was a situation that could be made whole for him or, like, could give him some closure, then I would definitely do it. But I see the act as being completely selfish and narcissistic, and that's hard for me to do. Well, I mean, then the living amend is more appropriate, and 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 you can trust your gut. So. You trust your gut on it. That's the most important thing. I think I'm like yeah. I'm drawn to the flash of uh, of writing Judd, and you know, I I like the idea of that being, you know, there's action and it's exciting. But listen, you know the situation, and if the better I mean, move is a living amend, then then by all means, you know. I can't say it was a better move is because I constantly make poor decisions, but I'm going to be completely transparent with you just because I'm realizing this as we're talking about it. Part of why I won't send an amends is because I know in my heart that part of the reason I'm sending an amends is so I can someday probably work with him just because I'm an actor who doesn't not want to be included in comedy. So there's no part of me. Like, you understand what I mean? Like, I don't think that's bad though. I don't think that's a bad thing. I really don't. Yeah, but I feel like it's. Uh, I feel like it, like if it, if that was me, I would just be like, eh, go away. Right. Really? Right. Because it may be, <laughs> but it's like I don't know. If you write a heartfelt letter, it's a spiritual principle. If he doesn't give a shit about it, that's fine. If he, you're just saying maybe it's counterintuitive to a spiritual practice because you would love to be included in a Judd Apatow project. Right. Right. But listen, I, yeah. I don't. I don't think that it's wrong. To, to make an amend like that and to be included in a Judd Apatow project. But let's just keep meditating on it and we'll come up with an answer. Meaning yeah, you will. A, that's healthy. Now, in that sober living, you have to have the most clean time by a million miles. Yeah, well, there's another guy who I think has been there for a couple months longer than me. And what is it like to have a chunk of time? How much How much time do you have? It'll be three years, January 25th. Exactly. To have yeah. years in a place where most people have days. Do people come to you? Are people just intimidated by your celebrity? What's the, the, the vibe in the house? I think really what separates me from the other guys typically is my age difference. You know, I'm 40s and these guys are 20s. So there's that right away. And that's just what I perceive as like the thing that is kind of our separating factor. But and we able, look at we we were able to uh, you know I, I feel like I'm one of the guys most times and sometimes there is just kind of a I feel like they respect me maybe a little more than they do each other because I'm a little older <laughs> so that might help but you know like I say there's a, such a revolving door there where you know as soon as I feel like I'm building a uh, rapport with somebody and a relationship's developing. 10 times out of 10, they end up leaving right away. So 
Is there a common room? Are you watching TV together? Are you cooking together? What's the scene like? Paint a picture. There is a there is a common room. There is a, a big living room, but everyone tends to just stay to themselves. Like people go on the back patio and smoke cigarettes and stuff. But like for me, I'm I'm definitely just off in my room the whole time. I don't spend any time in the in the uh, main areas and it's just not one of those houses like there's a lot of sober living houses where there's a lot of camaraderie and it kind of feels like a frat house and that's not the environment i was looking for either so i'm kind of happy about that but basically you know there's nine guys there you really wouldn't know if you just walked in the house unless somebody sets off the smoking alarm so everybody's just kind of to themselves in one room you have somebody that's been there 30 days another room there's somebody that's been there for a couple months so you know, everyone's just trying to get to know each other, but everyone's also at like this fort world in their life, you know? Yes, it's very temporary. So you don't make, I mean, I remember the last time I was in treatment, I knew that I, I had done it so many times that I knew that I wasn't going to know that many people for that long. But you never know, because that's where I met Chris, the guy who I started the show with was the last time I was in treatment. And yeah, you never know. He had been in so many treatments that he made a real point of not knowing anybody. And then you, we left and we wound up doing this. So you never know who you're going to meet or what's going to happen in any situation, really. That's true. Which is, which is, true. which is interesting. Now, New Year's is coming. What do you do for New Year's? And how do you start the new year to make it like the greatest year ever for yourself? Or for us, or for, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm starting to, like, write in a book. Like, I'm, I'm doing these morning pages every day, and I, I just bought a, a, a new calendar, and I'm trying to, like, approach this year on the attack. What's your plan? Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I'm kind of in a very similar wavelength. So I, uh, my niece is, like, really good friends with, and her business partner runs a, this awesome marketing company. So I linked up with them and for the new year, I'm basically just linking up with, I, you know, this whole time for the last three years, I've just been on my own. So, you know, but I've never had like any PR persons help me out or, or anybody like try to help me with a, with a book or anything like that, even though there's been like some offers come up, but I just have like a email box that's full, you know? So in the new year, I'm really focusing on having this marketing company figuring out a way to package what I do in a way that I can get out and speak and spread my story and try to encourage and inspire some people in this recovery game next year. You know, I spent last year kind of on a small scale reaching out to places to try to see if I could go speak, um, you know, do those kinds of things on my own. And I just, I couldn't get any traction. And I started to like, I went through all the different <laughs> The different stages of of grief right and then i i was like at denial i was like maybe they don't maybe they just don't want me and then i landed at and i hope i'm wrong i'm just like maybe these people just aren't interested in bringing in any sort of like effective curriculum at all you know and i'll tell you one of the things that makes me feel like that i like probably the most effective single tool that I encountered during my residential treatment was this EEG therapy, right? So it's this software called Brain Paint. And what they do is they hook you up. They they put all these like, you know, suction cups on your skull. Right. And they hook up these other things to your, you know, your, your pulse points. There's this software that you interact with. It's sort of like a video game. So like if you see a red box, you press the X button. If you see a green box, you press the O button. And while you're doing this, there's a, a series of sounds and things that you're reacting to. And it's a whole process. It takes about half an hour. So by the end of my 15th session, and I could feel my I could feel this thing working on me the whole time. But by the end of my 15th session, I think we did two a week, the instructor came up to me and said, I want I want to show you this printout. And he showed me a piece of paper. He said, this was a printout of your brain the day after you did your first session. And it looked just like uh, like a Rorschach ink blot test, right? Just line, just random ink on paper. And he said, this is a picture of your brain after your last, last session. And it looked like a mandala. It looked like a sunflower mandala. Really? Wow. And now I could definitely notice like, 
I was feeling, you know, much more calm and at ease and I was able to focus more. And this is very early on in, in my detox. And I was just, my mind wasn't racing as much. I was sleeping better. I wasn't having nightmares. And I could just definitely feel the effects of this thing going, going through it. But then at the end, being able to actually see the piece of paper was like, confirmation that this thing worked so i had done nothing but rave about this thing and i even called up the the owner of the the rehab and told him how much how grateful i was for this thing and how much it helped me anyway they discontinued it they don't even offer it there anymore and pretty much none of the places that offered it are still offering it i'm not sure why probably it had something to do with a financial incentive but this was you know one of the things that I found so helpful and that I couldn't get people to. Yeah. So I just started thinking maybe it works. That's why they don't want it. <laughs> That's a scary, I mean, horrible thought, right? You know, I'm not right. I, I hope I'm not just some, you know, and I'm not married to that. I'm just, I see it as a possibility because I couldn't figure out how come like places wouldn't see value in me going and talking and giving my story for like a, you know, I'm not asking for a lot of money to do this. I'm trying to go help people. You know, what's it called? So, EEG. EEG therapy. Yeah. Right. We have a lot of therapists and rehab people in dopey nation. So if you're listening and you know anything about this EEG, write us an email at dopey podcast at gmail.com. We want to know why they've discontinued this treatment that Sean found to be so helpful. And I'm shocked that you're not slated to speak at every fucking treatment. Your story is like so crazy and inspiring. And like, I kind of want to rep you and get you on a speaking tour. Bro, you don't want to rep me because I'm telling you, I haven't gotten one callback. I know, but I'm what? really persistent. I'm crazy. Oh, you're it. saying you're just gonna you're gonna catch him to death, and I'm, and I'm gonna go. Ba- I'm gonna go bananas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get you. I'll get. I'll get you into places. I'm crazy. Are you kidding me? That's what yeah, I do. Not as a, but I want to. I don't want to be in there as a patient. I want to be That's as a fair. speaker. That's totally fair. Let, <laughs> let me see what I can work. Let me see the magic I can work. Hey, and, I'm counting on Dopey Nation to take care of me, bro. Well, it's not. It's not impossible. I Listen, wish- David, I hate to ask you this in front of everybody, but you know that pair of dopey socks you gave me? Yeah. When you gave them to me, you said these are good quality socks, and yes. you weren't kidding, my friend. These are the <laughs> best socks I've ever had in my life. I, mean, I can wear them three, four days in a row. They don't pick up any odor. My problem is yes. I put them in the wash, Yes. and now I have only one. All right, listen. Number one, I cannot do anything about you losing a sock, but I can say, you can't send me one? I think I'd, I would like you to do a cameo about dopey socks <laughs> <laughs> and I will, uh, I'll, I'll put a bunch of the professional rate. Oh fuck. No, I will put, <laughs> give me your address and I'll send you a dopey care package. That's what you get. Thank you. I just need the left one. Just no, the left I'm going to send you a couple yeah, pair. They're very high quality. Yeah, don't socks. send me any of your pre-worn fucking beanies. Okay. That was a weird fucking move. You gave me a beanie that, you, that like somebody had clearly worn for like not even a little bit, like a lot. No it was way. DNA from like four different no, Jews in no, that beanie. No way. Prove it. How All do, right. How do you know? Okay. What, what makes what makes you say that? Because one hair's long and gray, one hair's short and gray, one hair's brown, one hair's blonde. You think I'm stupid? I can't tell the difference. I don't think anyone. I think I brought it in to give to you, Sean. I can't no, believe I can't. How I'm dare you? I'm not disputing you? that. I'm not disputing that, but you gave it to four other people before you gave it to me. Maybe it was worn around my house. Maybe it's just my family's DNA. Could but, be. Listen, Blame I'm going to. the cat. You give me, text me your address. You have a dopey care package coming your way. Yes. And, uh, yeah. and please send happy new years to all the addicts in Los Angeles, especially in your sober living. And thank you for coming on our new year's spectacular. Will do. Thanks for having me, David. It's always nice to talk to you. Sean. I feel better already. Listen, fucking don't be a stranger. And when you're back out east, you got to come back. Deal. All right. Oh, you still owe me. You still owe me brisket, dude. I know. Jesus str- I know. Christ. I know. I'm, it's, it's a whole thing. We'll, we'll make it All happen. Right. All right, Sean. I appreciate it, man. <laughs> All right. Talk to you soon, right bud. Later. So that's Sean Weiss on the perils and pleasures of living in a sober house. And if any of you guys are living in a sober house and you have some sick, crazy sober house stories, drop a line to dopeypodcast at gmail.com and 
Send a voicemail. You heard how high quality the socks are. The socks are super high quality. Send in a voicemail, send in an email, and you will get a pair. Or join the $15 level of Patreon. You wouldn't believe the shit that's going on there. We just had Ray Davies from the UK. Not to be confused with Ray Davies from the Kinks in the UK. This is Ray Davies from Birmingham. And he, uh, he really brought the dopey. He told a story about burglaring a chemist in Birmingham, and he grew weed. His signature weed was blue cheese, which is ironic because of the old blue cheese story. So go sign up for Patreon, and listen, if you're out there and you're waiting on a package from me, I want to apologize. I want you to send me an email and tell me what it is, and I will get it out straight away on Tuesday after the new year. I need reminders. I need help. So please send me a reminder. Remind me. Sign up for Patreon. We just got new pretty fucking fiery stickers as well. I'm going to post them. And we have one more guest on the show. He's called Fentanyl J because he used to deal and use fentanyl. He's uh, one of my favorite people. And here he is. Before I get to Jay, you know, again, I can't say how much I love Jay. I hope Jay is on the show a ton in the new year. I want to talk about this app. It's called Sober Together. It is this amazing free app. If you're an addict and you're lonely and you're in early recovery, go download the Sober Together app from the App Store. You check in. People see you. They write you back all with videos. So you're seeing with people. You're communicating with people. You're helping people. It's really perfect for anyone who kind of wants to go to a meeting but really doesn't want to go. Download the Sober Together app. And one person who's on the... There's a ton of dopes on the Sober Together app. But one person in particular who's on the Sober Together app is my friend Nat Kingsley. And Nat Kingsley, I'm going to blow his cover right now, is also known as Nat X from the Recovery in the Middle Ages podcast and i think you guys should check out the recovery in the middle ages podcast it's him and his buddy mike and it's all about being a recovering addict or alcoholic living in the suburbs it's called recovery in the middle ages it's like middle class recovery neighborhood shit parenting aa na no way just giving it a shot and seeing what recovery is like and then how you cope with it as a normal, productive member of middle-class society. It's Recovery in the Middle Ages. It's available wherever your podcasts are played. Check it out. And here, without further ado, is the one and only Fentanyl J. So we're coming up on the new year. The new year is right around the corner, and I am back in the car with J, a.k.a. Fentanyl J, right now. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Cue the uh, applause. Yeah. Yeah. Now... You know this, Jay, because I told you, but Jay was the most popular guest of the year. It's my greatest accomplishment to date. And what we had Mark Marin this year. We had fucking Sean Weiss, who's on the show today. He was a very popular guest this year. Fucking Josh Peck. Josh Peck <laughs> this year. Jason Biggs. Jason and somehow Biggs. Fentanyl Jay Whoa. comes out on top. What would you attribute to your success on the Dopey Show, Jay? Uh, dumb luck. I think it is love. Oh, I think it's connection. Hate. 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 Oh, yeah. He is a polarizing figure hate. in the dopey community. Now, I want to go over this past year, you know, why you stopped coming on the dopey program and what the new year holds for you. <laughs> now, last year, like, when did you get busted? So I got busted April. Two years ago. Of 2020. 2020. Wait, so 2020. What? You know better than 2021, I 20, April 2021. Damn. Right? Yes. Yes. Almost two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 20, April of 2021. Yeah. And then you, and then you got sober. And then I went hard doing bad right after that. And then I got sober in like September. Let's talk about that period again. Because oh, I, I think we glossed over it. Do you think that to. period post arrest was the wor- was the most drug addict that you ever were? Yes. Well, yes, yes, yes. Resound, break, resounding yes. Break it down. Well, the most, yeah. 
it was also like the worst I have felt about. Like maybe I was like doing maybe it wasn't like drug wise the worst. I was doing bad dr hard drugs, but like I wasn't even able to pay for a fuckload of them, you know, because I just got busted and all my shit got taken from me. So I, I it was just I was low, you know, I was low. Are these fucking seat warmers on. I'm feeling a little warm. Yes, I fucking knew it. Now let me ask you this: in that period of time. Like, obviously, they don't call you Fentanyl J because you like fentanyl. They call you, we call you Fentanyl J because you sold fentanyl yeah. for years from coast yeah. to coast in between body brokering, yeah. which makes you a yeah. nefarious figure yeah. on the planet Earth. Nefarious, good word. Now, let me ask you this, Jay. Yeah. How guilt, when does the guilt come into you for, for all that shit? Be honest. I know you have many layers of protective. Be honest. Yes. So it's never, <laughs> never. Oh, Is that the honest fuck. truth? Oh fuck. You want to say never? Like, just about never. Like, never. Oh my, dude. Oh, they why hate is that? Me for this. I just fucking. Uh, you think it's self-preservation? Me, possibly. That's possible as well. But yeah. The, I, I can't feel guilty. I can't. I, I just Explain can't. that. Because if you open the, the door on guilt, then... Then I'm fucking letting the floodgates down, you know? And then, then there's like fucking... Then that's just the tip of the iceberg, you know? So you fear the, the cataclysm of self-hatred. Fucking sick words. Yeah. What's happening? But, that's <laughs> the, but do you think that's what it is? Or... Like, and this is a fucking, I'm setting you up a little bit here, but, not, but it's like, I personally think you're terrified of feeling those feelings. Yeah, I'm not trying to. And, and, and I, I think you want to be like, I don't give a fuck. But in reality, it's like, I mean, if I give a fuck, it'll kill me. So I I'm give gonna a fuck about some things, kind of. Yeah, kind of. But like, I don't, I don't feel, I don't, I don't feel guilt for selling fentanyl i don't is that fucked up i you know it sounds fucked up now that i said it out loud it sounds fucked up now i'm starting to feel a little guilt maybe break it down <laughs> this is important break it down i don't know uh, now that i said it, it just sounds fucked up because you know it is fucked up people dying and doing drugs let's and start stuff. I, I think you don't feel bad about selling drugs because i don't people connect who want to get high yeah, you don't feel that, bad. On one it. hand, it's like I don't at all. Like you're, and it's not like I faked it. I didn't say this was something that it wasn't. I didn't, you know. And then again, I didn't even do hand to hands in the end. I just, you know, it was a one drop off to one person. There are two different people that get a lot, you know, that do what they do with it. And, I, and but it's almost like selling bullets. Yeah. And you're hoping that the bullets aren't used in a school shooting. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just sell bullets. I'm not That's shooting it. kids. Mm -hmm. Now. Wait, 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 but, but then when I make like the connection yes. of like, oh, drug addicts fucking can't get off drugs, it's killing hair and fan that can make you feel bad, you know. What about just the, the fentanyl deaths? See, that that's can make me feel bad. But it's like I in order to not the self preservation thing, in order to not, I separate it, you know? It's like what I was doing was selling something to someone for money, and that's what I did for money. But then when I look at the other half of it, like the families, all the deaths, all that. I, I like, keep it separated in my Well, I think the of. clinical term is compartmentalization. Oh, fuck, dude. You, You're fucking I'm banging out 10 today. points. It's happening today. today. No, I think you... It's happening. I think you it's all happening. You, <laughs> I think you compartmentalize the damage to, to self-preserve preserve you, you know, to, to be okay. It makes sense. Now, so what I'm hearing is you do feel kind of feel bad about it, but you don't want to go into that feeling because you'll feel worse. Yep. Now... I acknowledge that I should feel bad about it. And kind of fucking... We'll leave it there. I think we'll we should leave it, leave it open yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Now, after all that happened, mm -hmm. you went to treatment. Yep. You got sober. Yep. You dragged yourself to meetings. Yep. And you threw yourself at the mercy of recovering groups who nurtured you back. Yep. You want to describe that a little bit? Yeah, the meeting, it was important. Very helpful. Very, very helpful when I needed it bad you were a broken bird I and was, your wings were mended yeah my wings were fucking my, yeah i can i to fly you know but uh, it, it, i don't even know you know what fuck this i, I don't even go. know let i it, don't even i don't even fucking know yes if it was the meat i don't know if it was the meat i've been to meetings before 
you know, Jake, like don't once hold or back. twice. Don't hold back. Like, I think, fuck it. I don't, like, maybe it wasn't even, I, I don't know. Like, the meetings were good and gave, gave me something to do, especially in the very beginning. I want, you to, I want you to imagine for a second. Yeah. You, yeah. in the winter, yeah. your dad driving you to yep. the fucking beach, yep. you standing there in your jacket. Yep. Cold, yep. hugging everybody, yep. everybody loving you, yep. you telling horror stories when you shared, yep. people telling you how helpful it was to them. Now, I mean, get back to that moment. So, so it's helpful. It was good. It was a good feeling. I was sober. Isn't it easy to forget that? Now yeah. you have the sweet Jeep. You're making yeah. crazy money, a dirty taco. Every woman mm. in, in town is dying to be your next Oh, stop is, is, it, isn't it hard? Dude. Isn't it hard to remember when it wasn't like I mean, that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes or no? Yes, it's it's. Can you easy, put yourself easy back to in forget. those, those yeah, yeah. not new sneakers that it's you were in then? Easy to forget. Lamenting about your clothing, all the clothes you gave away. Oh, you're in the, the <laughs> crusty white Crocs, yeah. right? <laughs> but it's easy to forget. But I don't know if the fucking meetings brought me back. Maybe I just wanted it. You know, maybe because like. I've been to meetings before. Well, maybe I didn't find my, my little click. You know, I found like a nice little niche when I came back. That was, that was, I needed it. I needed it. And they needed you. I needed my, it. My yeah. point is, you were fucked. I was fucked. The story you told. I was fucked. Like, I'm not telling you you were fucked. You told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you told everybody. Yeah. And you got better. And you didn't have work. And you went there and, you're, and, you, and you rebuilt a relationship with your dad. It was yeah. very, very sweet. Sweet shit. And then you got hooked up with with Garrett, and you helped him build yep. some houses. Got my first job, and then ever. the doors open at DT's. Yep, Dirty Tacos. Yep. What's the philosophy at Dirty Tacos? It's it's chill. It's it's not like it, it's not like it's not like. Did the owner ever tell you his vision for Dirty Taco? Like, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think he. I think. It's supposed to be, it's, you know, it's the, it's, it is good food and drinks or whatever, but it's supposed to be like an atmosphere draw, you know? And what's the atmosphere? It's like, you know, you don't have to like button up your shirt to your neck with a tie, you know? You're like, what's up, guys? You can like, you, you can know. Be dirty and eat tacos. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And you fit right into Dirty Tacos. I did. You took to it quickly. I did. And I believe that Dirty Tacos was part of your demise. <laughs> It's possible. Dirty Tacos is not only a taqueria, it is also a tequilaria. I love tequila. Do you? <laughs> I do. Did you take this? Is that a new thing since you started working at Dirty Taco? Yeah. Or did you like tequila before I liked before tequila that? before that. So the last time you were on the show, mm -hmm. I sensed you were not in your pristine recovering form. Yeah. I sensed it. Yeah, he called it out a little bit, yeah. And then afterwards, I was like, what the fuck is going on? And yep. you were like, I need to tell you well, something. Well... I've been drinking. <laughs> and and so, it happened. So, like, lay it out. Because you put together... How much time had you put together? I put together a couple months. I think you put together more than a couple yeah, months. Yeah, like... I think you had eight or nine Eight months. or nine, yeah. What's the longest time you ever had clean? Eight or nine months. Eight or nine. Yep, from everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, eight or nine, for sure. What, what were you thinking of? Like, clean from... Well, no, no, no. If I was clean from, like, drugs... Then you're still... No, you're not I'm there. I'm not there, no. but it went a little longer than eight or nine. It went right. to, like, probably a year. Right, but does, that doesn't... You know, if you go to Narcotics Anonymous, they'll tell you that alcohol is a drug. Uh, they say that in the beginning of every meeting. That's a thing. Alcohol we cannot, is a drug? We cannot afford to forget, or something like that, that alcohol is a drug. Is it, though? It totally is. I mean, I guess How so. is it not? <laughs> I it's guess. In what universe <laughs> no, is it know, not I know, a drug? I know, I know. Now, why don't you break down the relapse, right? Like what I what, I just started fucking you know what it was I just started like but it is good not like getting bored but like fucking trying to do things like go out and fucking meet people and have fun and blah 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 and I did that I fucking did that you for did a, a little lot bit. yeah yeah I I did that and then was there something was it hard was it difficult to get social without the social lubricant of alcohol? Not not even that, because I meet plenty of people, like, while I'm working and stuff, I meet plenty of people, and, you know, 
it was more of like a fucking, I, you know, I needed like something, like a spark in my life. Like I needed like some fucking entertainment, you know? And like my entertainment's normally fucking crazy, you know? It always was. It always was. Your whole life. My whole life. So like I was just eight bored. or nine, yeah, eight or nine months of just not, like progressing. I wasn't stagnant, but I was like dying to fucking do something, you know? Right, right. I got like like that. You're also 27 years old. Yeah, I'm 28. Well, you were 27 then. Yeah. <laughs> you, you were 27 years old. Yeah. And you were like, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, like, why? Why? And you had lived a life of total debauchery. And you were like, well, why can't I be like just a normal yeah. young person? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And do you remember the first night that you drank after no. the eight or nine months? I remember the first drink I had, like. Did you have fear about it? Were you like, uh, I've been doing this every yeah, yeah, morning. Yeah. I'm talking about this fucking thing, and yep. now here I am. Yep. I did. Not like fear. I guess fear. I guess, I guess it's, yeah. you could use the word fear, I guess. Yeah, a little fearful, maybe. What, 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 what were you? <laughs> I was a little apprehensive, maybe. Fine. You know? You were, and then you were like, fuck it. And then I said, fuck it. Well, no, that night I just had a, like one drink. And, and you were making sure like the cops didn't come in from the yeah ceiling. like is everything okay Fentanyl pop up on the cool. table yeah everything's right. cool and then I started drinking like you know going out and drinking me whatever and then quickly I just started I I realized I don't I don't drink you know I get drunk you know like I'm not I'm not you a seem so like an actual candidate for alcoholics <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a good. I don't even know if I'm capable. Yeah, see, I don't even know if I'm a capable so, social drinker. I'm, I don't know. Wow. You know, seriously. I think you're dropping bombs. Yo, seriously. I think I fucking. I, I don't know. It might be. I don't, it's not like if I ever did that, that's what I'd want to do. You know, if I'm going to drink, I'm going to fucking drink. You know? So if you don't go give to have, me the unapproving eyes, no, of so fucking if you alcoholism. Have, if you, well, it seems like you're a total alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. Um, if it, so, if you're going out to have a drink, what happens? Just that I don't, I don't even do that. Well, it's like a running joke, you know, like oh, I'm going out for one beer, fucking ten shots of tequila, but one beer, you know. <laughs> Like, is that the new joke? That's like the running joke. Well, that's, that's not the <laughs> And old then joke, I right? won't even drink one beer. I'll drink like five or whatever. Back but, in the day, were you drinking a lot when, no. you, when you were using? No, not at all. Before I started using hard, I was drinking a lot. Not a, not a lot. Not like I am now. Like but, when you were selling Coke. Yeah. yeah but when but I, you did enough That's Coke when I was still pills, doing hand to hand. Yeah, much. I was fucking. Yeah, exactly. I, I would go out a lot. I wouldn't get like hammer drunk, though, because I'd be. Yeah, exactly. Be selling, the, the reason why I went out would be like to sell Coke. You know, and like, now you're out pounding beer, downing. Not, not even beer, just fucking tequila and lime juice. Okay, that's it. So, and and how much do you wish you were selling coke? I've thought about it. I fucking thought about it for sure. I realistically, would I do it? No, but I've thought about it. I'm like, oh, I can make a fucking. What's the? I can make a fortune over here. You know. What was the first worst thing you did in the new drinking? First, like bad thing. Yeah. Probably okay. So one night, this is the first bad thing. Yeah, first bad thing. One night, I was fucked. I got hammered. This one, this isn't even bad, but it was like the start of everything to come. You know, I was with my friend, who you know, female friend. Yeah, who you know. Okay. And uh, we're at fucking our our other friend's house. His name's Rocket. We're at his house. Why is his name Rocket? I gave him the, uh, the name Rocket, and he it, got the name Rocket, and it stuck. Okay. He was never Rocket. Till I named Why? him Rocket. Now everyone names Why? him Rocket. His name's Johnny. So I'm calling so Johnny, Johnny Rocket. Rocket. So then it's right, just, Rocket. now it's just Rocket. Right, you know? Right, right, right. And he embraced it. He I remember, it. I remember like you met Howie. Like you remember you went and yeah, you, yeah. I think you called him Howie Doodat. <laughs> Howie Doodat, yeah. It's like it's like uh yeah. I don't I didn't get a nickname. It's off the this is Davy Jones. Oh, uh, you didn't get a nickname. Well, what's happening? I did. All right. So so fucking you and Rocket. Off the cusp. He's Rocket now. Yeah, yeah uh -huh. straight off top. So now now we're at Rocket's house, and I'm... This is over the summer, I want It's say. definitely off the cuff, though, not off the cusp. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, All right. Okay, so you're at Rocket. What is it? Off, off the cuff. Off the cuff. Not off the cusp. Well, is cusp a word? Yes, it on is. the cusp of doing something. So, okay, so you're at Rock. <laughs> and fucking, I'm really drunk. And uh, our, my friend... Was like, all right, we should go. I've got like videos from that night. I'm like, 
playing. I don't know how to play guitar. I'm fucking playing the play? guitar. No. I'm like, fucking rock and roll, dude. I'm like, fucking John Lennon, you know? No, not John Lennon. John Mayer. My hair is fucking flowing, you know? I'm in, like, sunglasses, rock and roll. Yes. I'm hammered. Yes. And I don't even know where everyone is. It's just, like, me in this kid's basement. I think someone's sleeping on the bed. I don't know. I'm jamming. And uh, not good. <laughs> Very innocently, hey, let's go. Like, it's time to go. So the friend said, you know? And I'm like the defiant human, like, normally. You're not telling me what to do. Don't you? <laughs> and I lost it. I, and I, I lost it. She's like, what I was told, slash what I remember. She tried to tell me, let's go. I'm like, if you want to go, you can go. Like, you're not telling me when to go. Whatever. Eventually, we were fighting in the car. And she said, the whole way home, I'm like, sleeping. But I'm waking up and I'm screaming like, like, don't fucking tell me like scream like bad, you know? In your sleep, yeah, like like this. Your sleep, like kind of like sleeping. your sleep. And like, oh, I don't know breath. what the fuck you're talking. About. <laughs> you know, it was bad, and I don't like that about me. That, that happened at all. But that was like the first bad thing, and I didn't do that again. And what did your friend have to say? About oh, she didn't like it. The friend at you all. were that you were abusive. To yeah, yeah. <laughs> fuck. You don't want to be abusive to your friend. I don't. No. I don't. I don't at all. And what did what? How did she? Did she come at you for it? No, she knew there's no talking to me at that point. Anyway, continue. So that was that was like, number one. That was number one. All right. Then a few weeks later, yes. I'm at this other place, fucking dancing, whatever. They start turning the lights on. Everyone's got to go. Blah blah blah. blah. Uh, and I know the owner's there, so I think I'm like big shit, you know? So he's like, oh, you got to go. And I'm so drunk. And this is like a six foot six freaking dark skinned African ripped motherfucker saying, bro, got to go. I said, I don't know who the fuck you're talking to. I think you got to, you can go. I don't got to go anywhere. And he's like, what? <laughs> now, I was just talking shit at this point, you know? Like, so he's like pushing everyone out. Then, then like, then we start screaming at each other. And we, like, get in a little tussle, and I, like, hug him. I have him hugged. And I'm thinking, like, can I trip him? Like, how do I even do I'm hugging his waist because he's so tall, you know? Right. I got him around the waist. I'm like, what do I do? Like, can I get – how do I get this guy, you know? But I just kept on wishing, like, bro, I got you. I couldn't. I was lying. But I was like, I could trip you up right now. I kept on wishing, like, I got you because I'm hugging him, you know? So he can't, like, swing on me because I'm like, bro, I got you. I could fuck you up right now. Yeah. <laughs> and I definitely couldn't. No, but but you I, thought you were drunk enough. Yeah, yeah. I was like, drunk. bro, I'll fuck you up right now. And then whatever, it gets broken up or whatever. He comes back trying to fight, you know. And I was like, fuck yeah. You know, there's a lot of people in between us. But he's so tall. He's like, literally, this is not an exaggeration. He was six foot six. You can ask. He's a, sc like, he's, he's a security guard. Six four. Right. <laughs> so he only had a little bit of it. No, seriously. That's all like 5'11". Okay. Five. <laughs> <laughs> well, the girls listening, yeah. I'm six one. Right, right. But solid six one. Solid. <laughs> anyway, so you're hugging him. So I'm hugging him. It gets breaking up a little bit, and he's literally the security guard. So right. you know he's fucking huge. He's right. yoked. Now we split up a little bit. And there's like I don't even remember this. I was so drunk. There's like three. I don't remember getting punched anything at all. But then like there's a, probably like three or four people in between us. I couldn't reach his face right. if I tried. Right. But this kid just came over all four of them and clocked me right right here. I think I still got a lump from it. I don't know. Never mind. I got clocked pretty fucking good. I think I had a little, uh, maybe a little blood. Not like spillage, but like a little blood in the nose, you know? Fucking not. Thank God it was like down here, like next to my nose, not by my eye, because my shit would have puffed out to my face, you know? And is this all happening in Patchog? Yes. And Patchog is like after nine on the weekend, Patchogue is like the Badlands. It's right? madness. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. Every spot is just teeming yeah. with fucking wasted people yep. who could get into a fight like this at any second. Yep, yep, for sure. Every for sure. weekend, you can't even find a place to park. Yeah, no, it's impossible. That hectic yeah, yeah. In everywhere, everywhere, everywhere is lit. Yeah, the whole strip is lit. So that night was bad because I I was so drunk and then I got socked really fucking good. And I couldn't fight back. Even if I could fight back, it probably would have been worse for me. This guy, this guy. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I remember what he looks like. He's Did way you see too, him since then? No. He's way too fucking big for me to be talking shit to a guy like that, you know? Also, you were willing to and, fight because yeah. you were, like, black. And I'm drunk. hammered, and he's sober, you know? Like, sober me would dust a hammered me. I would scrape me, you know? But, like, but a, a sober, sober you him... also wouldn't be, like, engaged in the situation. It's also true. It's also true. That's another thing. If I'm sober, I would... Every single... 
fight, which is I've been in another, three, four, whatever fights I've been in, none of them would have happened. And I feel like I don't start them. That one I might have started. But, like, most of the time, I don't, <laughs> I don't start fights, you know? Sober, I, I don't even see you getting into a fight. No, probably never. You know, like, yeah. for what? Like it's true. You, you would not have that need. It's true. All right, now, what about drugs? It's been, it's been about half a year, you know, seven, eight months since you gave up your recovery. Put that away. What about, and, and for the beginning, you yep. were like, I'm not going to do drugs. Yep. Yep. So, so talk, walk us through right. the drugs right, of right. this year. All right, so the drugs of the year. All right, fuck. So it started off Uh-oh. fucking it's innocent. Worse than, it's worse than I thought, isn't it? It's a the same, right. a little worse. A little yeah, bit, it's, yeah. A, it's the same. You know it, but then there's yeah. not something, yeah. you know, yesterday happened. or No, this is a couple of days ago. Whatever. Fucking started off fucking going snowboarding with my fucking, oh, his shout out to Julie, her fucking boyfriend, Works with me. Remember? Vegan. Yeah, vegan. Yes. Yup. Shout out to vegan. So he's a big snowboarder. Triple black flip. Fucking three six. Literally like fucking serious. Hit serious hit. His hair's down to here. He fucking hits every jump. He's fucking. We go to the snowboard. They're like, oh, I fucking follow you. You're backflip John. At backflip J-A-W-N. I don't know if there's a space or anything, but. J-A-W-N. Like John. He's like, good, huh? He's good. All right. He's legit. Surf, skate, snow, hippie, you know? Seriously. Like, yeah, All seriously right. about that action. I'm with him. We're fucking drinking. Hammer before we get there. We're on the lift. And I can, like, I can't boogie, but I can, like, you know, get down the mountain normally, you know, unless yeah. I'm really, really drunk. I can, like, get down it. And uh, after that, we're fucking all going to eat. And we just, like, star. So I hit the blunt. And he smokes mad weed. So I'm hitting the blunt. And that was the first time you had first hit a time drug. I'd done a it. Real, yeah, yeah. A real drug. A real quote unquote. Right, 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 right. How do you think like weeds like a drug? Weeds for me, anything that fucks you up is a drug. So you know, so, I mean, really anything. So um, weeds, fucking right, a drug. I mean, like what? What isn't a drug? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's caffeine. I, I sugar. No, I don't put those there. Fucking. They don't fuck you up. Caffeine oh, that and fucks sugar you to, up? Yeah. I mean, those pre-workout caffeines when you're taking drug. like 5,000 milligrams. Drug like, addict. That's drug. Those are really strong. Drug addict. Yeah. They're, if, you're, they're, if you're snorting pre-workout, yeah, fucking that's a drug. phone in. No, but I used to take pre-workout in, in, my, in the end of my waiting days. There was a guy who... Was, to wait tables or to work out? <laughs> yeah, I never worked out. Yeah, I was going to say, what tables. the fuck? In my waiting table days, there was a guy that was obese and he got into into working out, and he would have this crazy pre workout, and I'd work twelve hours on Sundays, and I would take it, and I I felt like I was on speed. Yeah, so that yeah. felt very it's drug-like. good shit, drugish. Anyway, back to the story. I was fucking smoking weed. Yeah. Now we're in the biggest mall in America, American Dream. That's where we went snowboarding and stuff. It's right by MetLife. You know what I'm talking about? It's like oh, right yeah. next to the Jets and Giants stadium. Oh yeah, in Jersey. Huge yeah, mall. Yeah, 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 yeah. Indoor so, snowboarding. Yeah, yeah, that's where we were. Yeah. Then I fucking, uh, now I'm fucking stony baloney, bro. I'm fucking stoned, you right. know? Like, literally. And I'm like, I didn't almost didn't like it, bro. You didn't like I it. I didn't like it. Yeah, I didn't like it You don't it even at all. want to admit that you yeah. didn't like it. <laughs> You're like, I almost, you didn't like I it. I didn't like it. Yeah. Like, like, I felt like, I feel like. You weren't ready for it. I wasn't ready for it. I was already hammered, like, you know. And it's like, when fucking people have, like, intrusive thoughts or whatever, or if they fucking are freaking out, whatever. As far as I remember, when people were smoking weed, they kind of, like, keep it to themselves or whatever. And I just fucking, I just didn't like it. I was, like, angry, I feel like. I feel like I was, like, it you know. It fucked you up. It probably made you paranoid. It yeah, probably made like, you feel weird. Yeah, and if people feel paranoid, they can, like, get all internal. I'm, like, pretty external about it, so, you but know? It, but it probably counteracted your normal loosey-goosey external yeah. thing. And all of a sudden, you're thinking Now I'm thinking. Thought. All of a yep. sudden, you're feeling guilty about like, selling what fentanyl. What the fuck <laughs> is going it's on? All, it's Never all happening. again. Right? But then I did it again, probably a week later. This time, just not, one not hit. Not selling fentanyl. No, 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 no. Yeah. Okay, then you smoked weed the next week. The next week, same shit. Just one hit. Back in the day, could you smoke weed? Mad weed. Right. Mad weed. But it's over. Over. That's crazy. Over. I smoked one hit. I think I I, I told this story on the show a million times, but I don't know if I told you. I, like, had stopped doing heroin, Mm -hmm. and then I was like, I had done some Percocets, and I was like, you know, I'd like to do some heroin again. And I, I, Standard. I took a hit, and I, I, I took a shot. I shot a bag, and I was like, I don't feel anything. And he's like, shoot two more. I was like, okay. Oh. <laughs> so I shot two more, and it made me feel like, I always said it made me feel like I was being raped by the devil. No, like, it was just a bad feeling. Didn't like I it. I didn't like it. You it know, was because I was, you. I was on. It wasn't like some morality. Yeah. Thing. I just didn't like the way it made feeling. me feel. It was too much. 
And it reminds like me of this. Like too buzzed, like just it was. It took over my shit, like yeah, in yeah, a yeah. way that I was not comfortable. You weren't cool with giving you yourself up. You have to like up. get. Re- it's like it's like you need to get used to being fucked like that. Yep. I was not. You weren't prepared. raised. No, you just I got brand in, no fucking lube, just fucking straight in. Exactly. Fucked up. And that's what this kind of reminds me of. Yeah, you I got hit. prepared for that. I got fucking. Yeah, but for slain. the thoughts. Yep. So you did it again the next week. Yep. One hit, cool. Everything's cool. Since then, I've taken like another hit. Shout out to Dawn. I saw Dawn at she this party. Me. She saw. She came up to me. She goes. She goes. I saw our friend. And I was like, "What? You can't say his name? Why can't you say his name?" Yeah, yeah, I was faded. That that's the first night I did coke. Okay. So that night I fucking I'm shit faced at a party. It's just a common theme. I'm fucking hammered. Right. I fucking I forget. One of my friends was doing it in the bathroom. At first I was like, "No, no, no, no." Because I see it all the time. I was like, no. People know. Everyone around knows, like, I don't do cold. You know, the people I'm around, they just know I don't do that. But I was so drunk this time. I was like, fuck it, bro. And I did, like. So how many times had you said no to Coke? Since no. I don't know if I said no, but I've also just made it, like, off rip. Like, people know, like, a handful. A handful of times I've said, like, nah, I'm good. Was it weird to say no to Coke while you were drinking? Not really. Sometimes, no, not really. Because you knew your like, self-preservation. Uh, yeah, I like let it also be known that I don't do it, and like I was like, "Fuck it," and I've done enough Coke to fucking Anesthetize wake up rhino? John Lennon right. from the dead. You know right, what I'm right, saying? Right, right. Like, yeah, I've done a lot, you know, and that shit doesn't even tickle my fancy anymore, you know. So, but Except, I did it. Yeah, <laughs> but I did it. Nothing really. I was so drunk. I don't even remember it. Honestly, I just know that I did it, and that shit's just not enough anymore. Like I wouldn't do it. So I, th- what I think would... I did it again after. I think I did it recently. Like that's why I, said. I think I did it the other night. I'm not too sure though, because I was blackout. Every time they throw these events, like you know, fucking bartenders ball, fucking the chops party, all you can eat, all you can drink. Like my, I get hammered. So I think I'm. I'm pretty sure I did it the other night, but I. I, I, your guess, I don't know. It's 50 50. I'm pretty sure I kind of remember doing it though. But that, that, that's, that's where I draw a line. I, it's fucking done. No now, more. hold up. Now, let's stop for a second. Because Jay and I have been in touch here and there. You've basically like been like, I'm not going to darken your doorway with my shit. Because you're like, you're like, I have no use for you and you have no use for me. Kind oh. of thing. Well, you, no, I'm not me. I have no use <laughs> for you. I'm just saying you're like, I'm going to be living like a fucking kid yeah, 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 and yeah. doing my thing. Yep. And, and you don't really feel like calling me in those situations. Yep. We check in, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, I, I love you. I know you love me. And we have a, an incredibly strong bond. But when you're living that sort of style, you're not like dying to talk to me about it, yep. really. Yeah. You know, for whatever reason. It's true. And as we geared up, or we ran into each other, I think. I don't remember what happened. Yep. And uh, and then you were like, I want to talk to you. And then I called you, and you were walking your dog across the street from my house. Oh, yeah. I was remember actually, yeah. I was like thinking about you, and you called me when I was, I was thinking about you because I was walking past your house. Yeah. And then you called me, and I was like, what, did you see me out the window? Yeah. And you didn't. I was like, didn't. what? That's fucking... <laughs> I was like, what? That's it's an odd or is it Todd? <laughs> that's, that's an interesting thing. <laughs> Fucking Todd, man. Fucking big T. Well, it's funny because on the show, we call it a Todd shot because of my friend Todd that yeah. died. But there's a Todd that goes to our meeting. Yeah. And like, you know, he Oh, is it odd or is it Todd? Both, oh, both, both I things, see. Both things. Big T, little odd. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> big T, little odd. Yeah. But uh, he has a clothing company. You know about his clothing company? Yeah, with knuckle clunkers. Clunkers, yeah, and yeah. And he's in Dopey Nation. He's like, he's trying to infiltrate. Oh, word! I think his clothes are pretty good. The clunkers? That's not bad. Yeah, yeah. I've seen gloves. I think that's all I've seen. Anyway, for, we don't need his clothes are pretty nice. Shout, Shout out to him. clunkers. Shout out to Big Todd. Big uh, T. And and my friend Todd. Rest yeah. in peace. Love, R. I. P. love Todd. Anyway. What were we saying? So I'm walking past, oh, yeah. and then you think of me, and you call me, yep. and I was like, that's weird. But at the beginning of the month, we spoke. Or maybe it was the end of November, around yeah, Thanksgiving, yeah. and yeah. you were like, you know what? I want to come back. Yep. And, and you, I mean, I, I know you wanted to come back on the show, but yep. you really wanted to stop drinking. Yep. And you said, I want to drink every day in December. 31 days of drinking. And then be done. And then be done. So, so walk us through so, that. So I fucking thought it was 20 I thought it was I thought it was 31 days of Christmas. Like, you know, in December people do those little doors 31 Advent, days of Advent calendars. Yep, yeah. little little I doors. 20, I think it's 20 It's 20 doors, it's, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, doors, exactly. Yes. It's actually 25 days of Christmas. Yes. I was converting 30, I thought it was 31 days of Christmas. 
Because you were drunk. Because I was drunk. So I was like, you know what? Instead of 31 days of Christmas, I didn't do anything for Christmas. I never do anything for Christmas. It's going to be 31 days of drinking, you know? Right. Then I realized, like, oh, shit. It's only 25 days of drinking, you know? But I was already in deep saying 31 days of drinking, going down, new year, so new day, me. So day one of December. I think it started probably a week before December. Probably when I talked to you. It was probably when it started. At the same time, you were interested in recovery again. Yeah. So why? So, like, I need to fucking, oh, so many reasons. I need to get in peak physical shape for my fucking upcoming incarceration. Incarceration, yeah. Trying to get back into peak physical shape first, like, for real. Because when I, when I was fucking sober, I was fucking, I felt good. I was fucking you might have been able lot. to take the six foot six guy. It would have like been that, closer. In that form. <laughs> it would have been closer for yes. sure. Yes. You know? Yeah, since then I've fucking just been drink drinking's stopped me from doing a lot of shit. Like I'm fucking spending buku bucks. I'm spending dollars every night, like hundreds. On drinking. On drinking and eating. And bro. going out yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that. Hundreds a night. Which is bad. So like financially, physically. Also, like, with all this shit coming up, I want to, my upcoming incarceration this year, almost, I want to fucking, you know, go in there fucking right, you know? Like, I want to go in there a good mindset, fucking ready, fucking all that good shit. I don't want to fucking be cloudy at all, you know? And I notice, I notice, uh, and, and, and I'm waking up later, I'm fucking not going to the gym, I'm not being healthy, I'm fucking not getting shit done. Like I should be, because instead or of like being, you were, like I was, yeah, like I, like I fucking instead of going to the DMV. Oh, I tell you, I won two thousand dollars at the casino that night. That crazy night. That crazy night. And guess what? I can't cash it because my IDs expired. So I've got like a fucking two thousand dollars. Yeah. How'd you win it? Fucking black or red. Two thousand black or red. <laughs> Hit four thousand. Quit. So now I've got a ticket for four thousand. Hold, Hold on. You played two thousand and you won two thousand. Yeah. How long were you playing? One one bet. One you walk in there. Yeah. You send me the really ridiculous video message. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> then you put down the two thousand. Yeah, right win after four grand. Yep. And then you're like, we're out. Yeah, but I stayed there and got drunk at the bar more. But you knew not to play. Yes. So the thing is, the t that was like, because last time I went there, I lost way too much money. So I was like, this is it. We're going here this time. I'm fucking putting two thousand dollars in. What's up? Where'd you go? Jake's 58. Jake's 58. Todd's 57. <laughs> I really thought it was called Todd's 57. Yeah. All right. And, ha and, and you won, and that's good. Yep. Now, okay. So basically what you're saying is you were on a sober path. Yep. You were on a path of recovery. Mm -hmm. You got bored. Yep. You, you got a little entitled. Yep. You were like, what the fuck? I deserve to have some Hell fun. Hell yeah. And I also don't want to live the fucking... I'm reliving my fucking teens, my 20s. I'm fighting. I'm drinking. Like, if I didn't have this head, you know, if I wasn't clear, if I didn't have that sober time before, I wouldn't even have this thought to do it. But, like, I can see that, like, it's just like that. So if I just continue, it'll all happen the same way again. It'll be a big circle. I'll start selling coke. I'll fuck it. It's just going to turn into a big cycle, and it's just going to get recycled, and I'll start doing coke. Then I'll need something to do, Come, you know, doing, doing coke. Then I'll need to, something like a zen. I need to do opiates. Get all, It's just going to be a fucking mess. So I need to fucking stop it now. Stop it now. Go hard for the month of December. Well, it's almost over. I know, We're and right I've been there. going fucking hard. Do it's you feel like, like it? Do you feel like it's enough? It's like a fucking chore to drink now. Do you feel like it's enough? What? Do you feel like We're, what I've done? Yeah, I we're did a few it. days away. I did it. I fucking, is it going to be hard? Are you nervous about? Stopping? I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, the number one thing involved in early recovery is dealing with not yeah. picking up. Yeah. So, like, how much do you worry about that? I don't, I'm not, I don't think, I'm, I'm not worried about it. I think I'm going to fucking be able to do it. Because I've got so much shit. Of course you online. are able to do it, but what's the plan? You, I mean, like you, you said, you want to do it, but mm -hmm. you really will not go to meetings. I don't think so. Yeah, so, okay. No. So, how, what's your plan instead of it? How did you wind up in meetings in the first place? Smiling <laughs> Joe? Straight out of fucking, yeah, Smiling Joe. Right. Straight out of rehab, you know? But... Yeah, I fucking, I'm not doing it this time. All right. I just think gym fucking put a lot of my time into my health and then fucking put a, the rest of my time. Like when I was sober, I would like come down here and I'd read, you know, I just put really? in my time. Yeah. You'd come down here thing, and read? Over there. In the car or out there? In the car. You'd come down here and read in the car? 
Over there. Why over there? Land, Land's End. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You just sat That's there? That's my fucking spot, bro. You sat at Land's yep. End and you'd read? Yep, and look for pretty girls in their cars to come. You'd knock on the like, window. Look at me be like, being smart, be like, you know? Look, 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 look. <laughs> I'm huh, reading. <laughs> how do they know you're reading? No, I know you're holding the book, <laughs> but what do you do to get their attention? Nah, I've only, I really? Does the, does the girl pull up next to you and you're like, oh. and then you like, hold up the book? You ever a little toot toot? And you're like, I'm just reading. Like, whoops, I slipped on the horn. That's you know? like the George Costanza, yeah. like, would eat an Who apple. Who is that? Sounds George Costanza was, you never watched sounds Seinfeld? Sounds familiar. So I know Seinfeld. Seinfeld's Who's George? best friend is George. The oh, the guy. short, bald yeah, dude. He's he would, an ugly bastard. He, he would eat an apple before he would get on the phone so he sounded casual and masculine mm. on the phone. Because you, know, you never mm. feel as masculine and casual it's as true. when you're biting into an apple. True. Now, that's what I imagine you with the book. With the book, yeah. Like, look at me. I'm really handsome and obviously very smart because I'm, I'm reading alone. reading, hello. hello. Yeah. Has yeah. it ever worked? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Now, all right. So you're saying no meetings, but I'm saying you need to do something. No meetings. All right. And, None. And like, no, no, maybe. You never know. You never Just know. keep it open. Now, more importantly, incarceration. Yeah. The Dopey Nation wants to know yeah. what's going to happen to Fentanyl J. I'm going to go to prison. You think so? <laughs> Definitely. How do you know? I don't. I mean, I do, but I don't. So, so like, you know. Break it down. So, so where I got arrested. Ohio. Ohio. In the middle of the boonies. Like, I am in the sticks. You have no neighbors. It's farmland. You know. Like, nowhere close. The closest big city is Columbus. Mm -hmm. Like, to, for where? I don't even, it was Madison County or some shit. I was in, yeah, in Madison County. But it's put it like this. In Suffolk County, there's two jails. Riverhead, Yapank. Each hold, like, 800 to 1,000 inmates or whatever in one county. Which is better? Which is better? No, which no, one is better? This you, is better. Yapank or Riverhead? It depends. Yapank, you work at that nice farm. Yeah, Yapank's cool. It depends where you work in both of them, though, honestly. Have you like, been in either of them? I've been in both of them. And which is better? So I've never been in the new jail in Yapank because it was, like, condemned. They made, like, a new jail, which I heard is, like, nice because there's, like, basketball inside and handball inside, but you never got taken to yard. So it's all in your day room all day, which could be not, But it's also single cells in Yapank, the new part of Yapank, which is super nice. In Riverhead, you have to be, if you're in a working dorm, you have to be working in the OM to get a single cell. What's the OM? The officer's mess hall. So, like, you're fucking, you know. They're Making, in the kitchen. Yeah, but you're with the officer side of the kitchen, not like the C, not the inmate side. So that's how you get a single cell. If you're not sentenced and you're not working, you just have to be, like, a tough motherfucker or have a really crazy charge, like, murder to be in, like, a single cell. Everyone else is double bunk, which sucks. What's the longest you were in those places for? Six months. Both of them? Both of them. Oh, I got in a fight in Riverhead when I was in the officer's mess. I got sent to Yap Hank. I was also a fucking beast, bro. I was huge. I was doing like 40 pull-ups straight. Like my best one, I could do 50. Like I was huge. And I got in a fight with this fucking light-skinned kid, but he could, like chubby, chubby kid. Yeah. But he could dunk a basketball, you know? Like, so right. he was athletic. Right. Like he was, he didn't look very athletic because he was like chubby yeah. and shit, yeah. but he could dunk a basketball, which is like, you know, right. it's impressive, it's impressive yeah. you know? Could you dunk a basketball? Fuck no. Okay. Fuck no. Okay. Fuck no. But I was pretty fucking wide, bro. Right. Right. And he fucking, you know, I thought what the fuck I was in there because I was big and I was also didn't give a fuck. And, and you like, and you can fight. Jail. Yeah, I can fight. I like to do that shit. I did. Not anymore. <laughs> okay. I did. I, I remember, like, I, I was over something so stupid. Like, I showered every day at the same time. It was my shower time. And the way you say you're going in the shower is you put your towel over the rack. It means you're going in next, right? So someone had their towel over there. I was like, no, this is my time to shower. I don't care whose towel it is, whatever. Going to start getting ready. She goes, oh, I don't like how you fucking walk around here, like, thinking your big shit, talking to everybody. Like, blah, 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 blah. He's like, lace up. Like, put your shoes on. I was like, okay, bet. Now I'm thinking, oh shit, he's pretty, he's pretty big. <laughs> like, he's a pretty big guy. He, he says big, lace up. Yeah, that's how you know. That, it's yeah, going yeah, that's down. how you know it's going down. That means like, put your fucking Shoes your velcro on, straps on and let's, let's go. Yeah, oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah, yeah. If anyone said lace up to me, I don't know what I'd, I'd be would like. Do. What? <laughs> no thanks. I don't want to lace up. <laughs> I'm good. No I'm laces. Good. No, I'm not gonna lace up. <laughs> so he fucking said that shit, and now I'm in my cell. You're like bet. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, all right, bet. I so I fucking now you need to write a fucking book. I'm you not mean, a good writer. Listen, listen, I got a journal. If you go, have you been using it? No. If you go, when I come away, to Land's End, so everyone knows I'm yeah, creative. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's what you want the journal for. 
Do you have glasses? <laughs> oh, I should get some. Yes. Though. Listen, if you go away, you got to read this book, Stephen King on writing. You're Stephen gonna write, King? You're going to write a great book. Stephen King? Yes. Yes. The horror guy? Yes. It's a great book. And he's in recovery. Is he? Just like you're about to be again. No. Anyway, so you, you lace up. Oh, yeah. So I'm sitting at the foot of my single cell bed yeah. in Riverhead. Yeah. I had the single cell at the time because I was working in the officer's mess hall. So I'm sitting on the bed. He yeah. comes to my doorway. And he says, like, what you want to do? And I fucking hate when people say that. What you want to do? Like, I'm doing what I want to do. What do you mean, what do I want to do? But, like, as I lace up So when he says shoe, that, he means, are you really sure you want like to get right, into a fight yeah, with Yeah, like, right what now. do you want to do? Like, right. what, you know? Can we so, have, maybe we want to talk it out. Yeah, maybe yeah. Like, that's what, what you want to do. What if I said, like, yeah, yeah sit down, bud. Let's talk about Let's, this. Come here. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> he was ghetto, though. Like, he was fucking, like, you know, pretty gangster. Okay, he so, was so fucking, translate for me. When he like, says, like, what do you want to do, like, mean? like, it means, like, fight me or you're a bitch. Like, right. what you want to do right. about this? You know? like, we don't want to talk about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're either a little bitch or you're going to fight me, right? Yeah, yeah. So, fucking, this is my first fight in jail, too. So, like, I didn't know the rules or anything. So, I fucking, I put my shoe on, I laced my shoe up, and I knew I had to blast him first because, like, He's bigger than me, and he's kind of athletic, had probably a little bit, but I'm also fucking yoked at the time. I'm right. fucking strongest I've ever been in my life, and I'm not a weak guy. I'm not a little guy, you know? Like, I'm fucking... You're like 6'2". Yeah, I'm 6'2". Six, six <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so I fucking put my... And I fucking blast this kid so fucking hard, bro, right in his nose. Immediately, you know, you start a fight. And you get blasted in your nose, immediately your eyes close, your eyes are tearing right. up. His nose was leaking. I'm right. telling you, leaking. Blood. Blood. Fucking so much. Because I had a clean shot. His hands are out his side. And How he's saying, he what you want to do? Oh, that, as, right there. As a uh, Jew barely got legal? out of his mouth. Is it's legal. legal. Okay. It's all legal. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's all. You're, you're, he's you're in, in the cell of my sorry, door. You well yeah, yeah. Make the most exactly. Of it. He's There's in no my cell. Rules. So I can fucking do exactly. So before he even said, before he even finished the sentence, boom, blasted him. Because if, <laughs> if I didn't, he would have beat me up. So. <laughs> so now we like tussle around. I got, I got the, I got, I'm good. I'm throwing lefts. Like, why, like I have him under my right arm wow. on the bed and I'm clobbering him as best I could, right? I'm not sure how great the shots were, but they were all hitting somewhere at the top of his head, whatever, you know? CO comes in. He says, like, stop, stop. And like, I didn't know when the COs tell you to stop, like you're supposed to stop, you know, like you don't keep going because now the CO is here, whatever. So they give you like three verbal warnings or something. And then they keep this 40 ounce can of fucking mace, like bear mace. Oh, it's, for, no. it's huge, bro. It's huge. Do you mean it's for bears? Yeah, it's fucking huge, bro. And it's and it shoots. Do you like think a it really fucking, is mace designed for bears? I feel like it's. I feel like it is. This shit. Did fucked you come up with that phrase? Me? Bear uh, mace? No, I think that's what they call it. Okay. That's what they and they call it a 40 because it's like a big 40. 40 ounce, it's big. Right. I'm not sure if it's 40, but it's 40 big. 40 ounces you of know? bear mace. Yeah, yeah. They fucking. Someone, eat. if any artist in the Dopey Nation want to make a label for this product, <laughs> I would love to see it. It's Email fuck, it to yeah, Dopey yeah. Podcast. Bear at mace. gmail.com. 40. Yes. 40 ounces. 45. You know? It's horrible. I just Dude, see a bear and a kid macing his eyes. He from the fucking label. whipped this. He's like, stop, stop, stop. I didn't even hear shit. I didn't hear him telling me to stop. I didn't hear shit. But I'm in a wife beater, right? And I get fucking, this guy lets this cannon go. Bro. I think that's a phrase that people might not like. We're going to call it a tank top. <laughs> I'm in a white tank top. Yes. And uh, I get sprayed across the back. I fucking turn around. I caught it right in my face, bro. Right in my a direct hit. The mace. The mace. The bear mace. Direct hit, Horrible. right? So now they fucking come in. Now I'm, I hopped off this kid so quick. I was fucking... Well, I'm, and then they separate us, and I'm screaming, get me the fuck out of this cell. Like, bro, I couldn't breathe. My fucking whole shit's running. They come in. They cuff me up. I can't see anything because I got sprayed right in my face. My eyes are closed. I start, and then they start walking me through. I'm looking like a fucking warrior, bro. They walk me out of my cell. Fucking, I'm in a white beater. I'm huge. There's blood all over me, not mine. And my snot is hanging from my nose to past my kneecap because I just got mace in the face and I couldn't fucking do anything. But, bro, I'm, I'm parading around like this, bro. I look like a monster in jail, you know? <laughs> mm, fucking <laughs> snot, literally yeah. four feet of snot still yeah. connected to my yeah. nose. Crazy. I'll never forget that. Like, holy shit, look at this snot. And then uh, <laughs> it was snot. fucking crazy. Even your mucus was yoked. Yo, and then... They take me to the nurse, whatever. They wash me off and shit. They move all your shit for you. They leave all your good shit. They bring your blankets and shit and your shoes. Bro, you feel that shit for three days. The, three the days. Base. Yeah. You put your blankets on. Did the guy on. ever come back? No, we split. I got sent to Yapank after that. So Did got, you work at the farm? 
no i i was i was no bad boy to him then because i fucking got in a fight you know so they, hold on what were we, we were, we're talking about your chances of you going to prison oh shit we get so, off topic so what are the, i appreciate that story but what are the chances Probably like ninety percent. I I, I want to say like fucking ninety percent. Oh yeah. So it's a small fucking jail. Where I got arrested. Five counties wide, two hundred fifty inmates. Three hundred. You know, and it's five counties wide. So with the amount of drugs I was arrested with, three thousand fentanyl pills, quarter kilo of loose fentanyl. With everything I got, three thousand fentanyl pills and a quarter kilo of loose, loose fentanyl. fentanyl. That's yep. powder. Yep. Yep. Like five hundred grams. Five hundred thousand lethal doses of fentanyl. That's the charge. Yeah, it's 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 what would you imagine? Of the first. F1. You're saying ninety percent mandatory drug offense, MDO. And what do you think you're looking so, at? So so max is twelve with the MDO. Mandatory. You get twelve, you do six. There, I'm not sure. I think it's normally three quarters or like you know. So if you get twelve, you could do eight. Yeah, that's what it is in New York. I'm not even sure what it is over there. But you haven't heard back from anybody no. in two years. No, because it Is was that dropped. Normal? Yeah, it was dropped from the court that I went to since because it, it's such a small court. It was dropped from municipal court. So they have two years to have felony court pick it up or federal court pick it up. So I'm crossing state lines with a lot of drugs, so it could be a federal charge too. So there's two years from my last court date. I believe my last court date was in like April. I got arrested April 2nd, so like, Probably shortly after that was my last court date. They have two years from that date to pick me up, which they have to pick it up, like felony court, federal how, court, whatever. Do you know anything about how often people let it go this long? I'm pre- I, I think I know what happens all like my friend, my my homeboy's big older brother, they waited till the last day to get him for conspiracy to murder for eight years. He last eight day. Years, the last day. Like one of the last day, second to last day. So you have no That's like the only instance that I that I know of that, like something like that happened. But they waited for the last day and they picked him up. And that's how the courts operate. That's just how I see them operating, you know? Right. Like, so so you know, so so you think you're gonna do time? Yeah. You think you're gonna do a bunch of it? I think I'll probably do hopefully uh, like four years, maybe or something. And and you're hoping that uh, you go in as sound mind and body as possible. Sound, yeah, exactly. Well, and we want the new year to keep new this year, off. new me. Yeah. Yep. And you're with it. I'm hundred percent in. All right, and uh, and you'll come back on the show here and there, here and there, and uh, and we'll hang out all the time. All right, well, best yeah. buds. That sounds good. Susan was was excited that I was going to see you this morning. Oh, shout out to Susan Nora, bro. What? So, so that's nice. Listen, Jay, I believe in you. I think it's going to go okay. I hope so. And uh, and thank you for coming on, and, and Happy New Year's. Love you. And you're going to fucking do this, right? I'm going to fucking do it. All right. And Dopey Nation, I know half of you just need Jay in your life and want to be inside of him or him inside of you. And the other half is it, doesn't feel that great about it. Hate me. So... You know, send in an email to dopeypodcast at gmail.com. Let us know. Send the hate mail. Lace them up. And, uh, <laughs> and thank you for coming back. So that was the one and only Fentanyl J back on Dopey uh, to close the year out. He was the most popular guest of the year. And one of the least popular guests of the year is now with us, my dad. Welcome back to the show. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that great intro- in- introduction. That's that's really nice. So me, my dad, his lady friend, and uh, Linda, Nora, and Susan go out to dinner last night uh, to Dallas Barbecue. Linda gets a steak. Susan gets mac and cheese. Uh, his friend gets his lady friend gets a power bowl with quinoa. Me and Nora split a rack of ribs and barbecue chicken, rice, baked potato. My dad orders a goblet of guacamole with chips. I, just, I did not know it was a goblet. I was not hungry, and I figured everybody would share the guacamole. The, no. and, and your friend David makes a big deal out of this. It's because my dad has developed bulimia at age 78. <laughs> he's so, like, he's so like concerned that? he's skipping lunches. Why are you skipping lunches I, for? I don't skip lunches. I eat. Did when you I'm eat lunch? Did you eat lunch today? Yeah, I just had it. That was not lunch. <laughs> I came back with a small wonton chicken and rice soup, and I, out of the goodness of my heart, gave my dad most of it. I after after quote uh, Nancy, my wife died. I got the habit of eating when I was hungry. I mean, you know, I didn't have to. I have a good breakfast, though. How worried about what your intake is on a daily basis? 
I'm not worried about it, but I certainly have intake. Do you like to impress people with the lack of food you eat? Yeah. You do. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Now, it's the end of the year. Do you want to make a comment, an anti-fentanyl J comment before we move on? No. Uh, no, I'm not going to make an anti-fentanyl J comment. I'm going to make an anti-selling of fentanyl comment. Yes. Well, fentanyl J isn't pro-selling fentanyl. He was a, a, quite a lucrative fentanyl dealer back in the day, but now he's a, you know, a mild-mannered waiter. Okay, that's wonderful that he's a mild man. He's trying to return to recovery in the new year. That would be good. Now, Dad, Nostradamus, a.k.a. Juistradamus, yes. what do you predict for the new year? Well, Do you want to predict the ninth million download? Oh, for sure. What's your prediction? Well, my prediction is, is it 8.8 right now? I think it's 8.75. Oh, at 8.75, I would say the nine millionth uh, download will be... May May third, May third, May third, two thousand and twenty-three. Do you want me to give you my prediction? Yes, April first. Oh, yeah, it's not so far off from mine. Well, it's a month. It's a month and change. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, <laughs> okay, don't now, be nation. You probably should pick something. Make uh, a different. prediction. Send in. <laughs> if okay, listen. In the next week, predict the ninth million download, and you can win free socks. And you're actually you've really been sending them out. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, in there. <laughs> Here and there. So what else do you have to say? The year is over. What what you wanted to do a year in review. So what's the year in review about Dopey? Uh well, you had some great ups, a lot of good stuff, a couple of little bleeps here and there, but it was a good year. What what did, Dopey. what did you just say? I, I said there was some good stuff and you had a little bleepy stuff. What when what's bleepy stuff? That you should have bleeped it out, but you left it in. Wow. You know, <laughs> I played the wrong I played the wrong version. I played the wrong version. That will haunt me for the new year. Yep. What was your favorite show of the year, Dad? My f- favorite show? You have no idea. Of the year. I can tell. <laughs> can I say they were? No, they weren't all my favorites. That's for sure. Uh, my favorite show of the year. Give me some clues. What, what pops your... into your head? Um, my favorite show of the year was Fentanyl J. <laughs> oh, please. Uh, I liked uh, Fentanyl J. I loved Mark Maron's a second appearance. I loved... Uh, I thought, uh, what's his face? Josh Peck. No, fucking Jason Biggs was good. Josh Peck was good. Uh, who did you like? Well, I certainly, I certainly. You didn't en- like any of them. No, I certainly enjoyed DopeyCon and uh, ah, DopeyCon. Yeah, the magic of DopeyCon. Yeah, I did enjoy that. That was that was a big adventure. Um, and um, anyway, so I just want to wish everybody a very very happy New Year, and I hope everybody everybody stays well and healthy. What he's dying to say is that his friend Seymour refuses to come on the show. <laughs> no, Seymour's afraid of David. <laughs> no, he's not. He's afraid of me? Well, he doesn't he doesn't want he doesn't want to happen to him what you do to me. <laughs> well, you know, Seymour is the is the narcissist fiddler. He calls the tune and everybody needs to play along. It's not true. And uh, and, and and just, you know, I'm sorry to anybody out there who struggles with fantasy basketball, but why don't you give an update before the year is over, Dan? Right. Guess who's still in first place on the Not end Seymour. of the year? It's me. I am in first place. You're a sick person. Daryl's in I second. And God. guess who's tied for third? Me? And Seymour. With Seymour? Yes. Is he upset about that? I bet she is. I'm not even paying attention. <laughs> I'm doing it all in my sleep. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say to the Dopey Nation before we go? No, I just I just said I'll say it again. Have a ha- very happy new year and stay healthy and toodles to Chris. Oh, I forgot to say that there was the article in uh, in the Detroit Free Press that my dad refuses to pay a dollar to read. Again, he is How Ashanda. <laughs> did you read the article that Suki wrote? Yeah, that was very good. You I liked did that read article? It. Right, right. Did you meet Suki at DopeyCon? She I, flew in from San Francisco. I, I maybe I did, but I don't I don't remember. I'm not sure. And I'm on B Getz's podcast this week, uh-huh. The Up Full Life, and that was good. Yes, I think it was very good. I need to listen to it. But in in person, it was great. Okay, that's good. So that's all you have to say. Yeah, I said it again. Have a happy, healthy New Year. Well, thank you, Dad. I love you. I love you too. That's very nice. Do you think I tell the guests I love them too much? No, you can say it's never. Ne- it's always uh, beautiful to say you love people. Yeah. So you're saying what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Dad. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Dopey Nation. Stay strong and fucking toodles for Chris. Hey, huh?
I'm gonna play this song, but only because uh, I think it's gonna make me look a little bit older and tired. I'm just gonna stare at the intro. Where did you write? Where did you write that? I like the lyrics. I hope they can hear. 